Okay, we will call our meeting to order at 3.32. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson. Here. Trustee Crane. Here. Trustee Wagon. Trustee Pearson. Here. Trustee Murphy. Here. Trustee Ursoilu. Here. Trustee Bartow. Here. Dr. Smith. Here. Okay, um, and there are two changes to the um, adoption of the minutes. There is a change to the um, agenda on consent item 21D1 to be changed from approval to ratify as the school support services and the agenda item has already started. Um, and then also for number nine under the adoption of the minutes um, from the meeting on February 15. Um, there's just a small edit related to one of our board members got here earlier than is noted. <laughs> um, that is it. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. I'm sorry, who was the second? Okay, moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Ursulu. Uh, roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wagon? Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Okay. And we do not have any community input on closed session items, and so we will now move to closed session. Um, the items are 4A, conference with legal counsel, potential litigation, 4B, conference with labor nego negotiator, 4C, public employee discipline, dismissal, release, employment, 4D, employee um, discipline, dismissal, release, or employment, 4E, employee discipline, dismissal, release, or employment, and student discipline, two cases. We will return to open session at 6 p.m. Thank you. Okay, we, will, we are back from our closed session. We are going to start our meeting now at 6.02. And I have um, some items to report out. Um, the item number public employee discipline dismissal release um, for number 202302HR. Um, the roll call vote for that was six eyes, no O's, no no's, and one absent. And, and regarding, oh, that, that's it. Okay. okay. Um, and now, Um, and the second one was for board ratification, the notice of non-reelection of probationary certificated employee pursuant to Education Code 44929.21. Um, in closed session, the board took action to authorize the superintendent or designee to give notice of non-reelection to a certain certificated employee, CE202301, who shall be released from their certificated position at the conclusion of the current school year pursuant to Ed Code 44929.21, and the roll call vote was as follows. Six eyes, uh, zero no's, and one absent. Okay, and we will do our opening ceremonies led by Ethan. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. And can I have a motion for adoption of the minutes as amended at the beginning? So moved. Okay. Have a second. I second. Okay, moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wagon? Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Okay, and now we'll have introduction of staff. Summer Harding, Director of Health Services. 
Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, President Anderson, Board uh, Dr. Smith. I'd like to invite Summer Harding to come up to the podium um, as I introduce her as our uh, new Director of Health Services. And just a little bit of background about uh, Summer. She has uh, 21 years plus in education and um, in the last six years, she's been in our district and she's been the principal at both uh, Newport Heights and most recently uh, Newport Coast Elementary. And um, we were very um, fortunate that she applied for um, the director of health <laughs> services position and really has kind of seen beyond um, the um, the health aspect and really embraced the, um, the intersection between health and academics and, and health and education. And um, she has a vast experience in special education, 504, um, and she really has a thorough understanding of how to work with parents, how to work with staff, how to work with community and other partners, which will be um, essential as we move forward kind of to the next um, iteration of health services for our family and for our students. Um, and she's jumped into the job uh, since she started at the um, very end of January. And she's um, has been meeting with all of the health services staff, the nurses and our health assistants at all of the school sites. Um, along with all of the principals to understand um, where health services fits into their work and their world, and then also really starting to um, develop some of the relationships we have with our community partners and looking at the HOPE Clinic, which we have. So um, very excited to have her on board um, and uh, welcome her into her new role as Director of Health Services. Well, thank you so much, um, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Smith, Dr. Jockum, Cabinet. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here this evening and welcoming me into this new position of Director of Health Services. It's an interesting transition for me, having been a site principal for 20 years, middle school and elementary school. But when I think about it, I think that the experiences that I've had and the things that I've learned from working at a school site all those years will be really informative towards uh, our work with nurses and health clerks. I am having to learn a lot of new acronyms, I will admit, um, but I feel really honored and privileged to be serving the community that I grew up in. Some of you know that I did attend all Newport Mesa schools K-12. Um, I still have family members that are students here. I saw my niece at Mariners this afternoon when I was there. Um, so I really feel privileged to be taking this position and working on such an important topic as health, um, because you can't learn if you're not feeling well, is what I say to myself. So. Um, We'll do the best work that we can to make sure that our students are well served in health services. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I do have my family here. I have one daughter she's in the back and my husband, Lindsay and Kurt. I, one of my daughters just moved to Boston. She's an attorney and she's now working. So we're crying um, that she's not here with us in California, but she's doing good work there. So thank you so much. Next up, we will have recognition of secondary education student award winners. Uh, President Anderson, trustees, and Dr. Smith, it's my pleasure to welcome up Dr. Mike Shaka, who's going to introduce our item for this evening and our wonderful students. Good evening, President Anderson, members of the board, Dr. Smith, executive cabinet, and all of our guests tonight. I have some more exciting news about our amazing Newport Mesa students. Tonight, we are celebrating our STEM on the sideline students from Costa Mesa High School. A few months ago, our all girls STEM on the sideline team placed second place at the annual competition. The event was located at SoFi Stadium in partnership with UCI and the LA Chargers. It marks the fourth consecutive appearance at the event and they have placed in the top two all four years winning in 2020 and 2021. This year's team named the Love Bolt constructed a device named Herbie the Love Bolt. <laughs> I'd now like to call up Dr. Potness to introduce her staff and her team. Thank you, Dr. Shaka, and to our board members, superintendent, and executive cabinet for giving us this opportunity to celebrate today. Can I please have students Aubrey Spallone, Kayla Stanley, Kira Kirsch, Caden Lowry, 
and teachers Racine Cross and Kwong Nguyen, please come up. So March marks an important month because it is Month of the Women. <laughs> and Costa Mesa High School is so proud of our young women in STEM. These ladies are inspiring, self-motivated, -motiv determined, gritty, and brilliant. We congratulate them on this huge accomplishment and want to extend gratitude to our amazing teachers who helped facilitate and championed our students' learning and risk-taking. So here's our team. Thank you for being so incredible um, and amazing students and leaders. Squeeze in. I need to hear one for my Instagram, okay? <laughs> that means vertical. <laughs> Next up, we have our student board member reports, Trustee Crane. Okay, tonight we're hearing from uh, our Cloud Campus representative and also our Corona Del Mar High School representative, student board members. And so we will begin with Ethan Krause and the re report topic that we had given uh, to the board members is, what are ways that you as a student board member make a difference in your own school community? And then after that, they will share some of the highlights on their campuses. Ethan? To help my school community, I have volunteered to participate on our WASC committee, which is for our Western Association of Schools and Colleges Accreditation. I have helped my teachers and principal to be a voice in our school assemblies and to report on our senior class. In addition, I have helped make a difference in my school community by working with other seniors to better mental health in our community for our senior exit project. And then coming up in cloud, we have our quarter grade assembly that recognizes students for their academic success and character in senior photos next week. All right, thank you. TJ Rokas from Coral Del Mar High School. Thank you, everybody. It's good to be back. I hope everyone had a great ski week. Uh, some people want to say President's Recess, but since I represent CDM, and most of our moms have a mandatory trip to Aspen during this time. I'm going to keep calling it Ski Week. Uh, it's true, the best thing I can do as a representative of my school is to keep the Port Street moms happy. I think Mrs. Gamble and I were just talking about that. Um, anyways, an exciting event coming up at our school is our next episode of Hot Seat, which will feature Dr. Smith. Um, hopefully he doesn't fire me. I might want to sign a contract beforehand. Since, the, trustee, since um, the question that Trustee Crane gave us was about how each of us gives back to the community, what better gift can I give to the students than watching me go through hell on our school news uh, show? So the second way I'm currently giving back to the community is through my involvement in the planning of the car show. Nobody will profit from this except for the community. And we are expecting a lot of alumni to be there. Mrs. Pearson, we are excited to have you as an honorary judge. And I encourage everyone to come out to the pool parking lot on Sunday, March 26th at 9 a.m. See some cool cars. All are welcome, even the annoying people that drive their Ferraris going 115 miles an hour down Jamboree. I assume most of their kids go to modern day, but they're welcome anyways. Sorry, full of zingers tonight. There are uh, certainly other moments I could highlight, like my work with Monte Vista Elementary School, which is part of Santa Ana Unified School District. Uh, we're building out a coding class, which actually just launched on Monday. Um, as we know, the future is tech, and equipping these kids with computer skills may be their best way out of poverty. But I was raised around the fact that you give back to the community to better, better the lives of those around you, not for personal recognition. Today, I'm concerned with what I'm seeing from my generation in this regard. It's amazing now that college applications are done, far fewer people want to give back. It's weird. There is a lack of integrity and humility in community service these days. In other words, people are in it for the wrong reasons. Life's not all about essays. You should want to give back to those that didn't get the same privileges that we were blessed with, not just to better your college resume. This may be the wrong crowd, but as far as I can see, the college application process is nothing more than a marketing scheme. 
They have sold us on the fact that higher education is necessary for success. Many colleges have tuition rates higher than the average salary of a worker in the United States. Do you know what Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, and Mark Zuckerberg have in common? None of them have fancy Ivy League diplomas, but the people that work for them do. Now, I'm not demonizing college. I'm going to an overpriced university myself. But in a generation that holds equality and equity in such a high regard, why are we valuing individuals based on how prestigious of a school they get into? We must also consider the fact that our nation seriously lacks the labor to fill manual jobs. Somebody has to pave the roads so that college grads can get to their overpaid consulting jobs. Also, according to The Economist, recruitment for the US military in the year 2022 appears to have, the, have been the worst year since the draft ended in 1973. So I would like to take a moment to thank my peers who are choosing to enlist and go defend our freedom overseas. They've been underrecognized, and that's something we will work on fixing at Corona Mar High School before I am gone. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. As always, it has been an honor to be your servant. Thank you for choosing me. God bless you. TJ, thank you to Newport Mesa for providing pathways in career technical education. So we can start there. Okay, next up we have our Harbor Council PTA report, Kate Gamewell. Good evening, Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, the trustees and cabinet. Uh, my name is Kate Gamewell and I serve as the secretary for Harbor Council PTA. And I'm here representing Cynthia, our president, who uh, sends her regrets for not being able to attend tonight. But I'm happy to provide you with our update from Harbor Council PTA. The Reflections Art Program is an annual program, and the, um, it's a nation, national program. But our fourth district PTA hosted its annual Reflections Gallery and Reception on February 11th at the OC Department of Education. And I'm proud to say that we have three Newport Mesa students moving on to the California State PTA Reflections level of judging. And these three students are Gabby Sabo Tuka from on literature from East Bluff, Zar Zar Zubar in literature from Costa Mesa High School, Paxton James Onstott in music comp composition from Early College High School, and so the results of the state reflections art contest will be announced in late April. So I'm sure Cynthia will share with you how we did at that point. We also wanted to make sure you save the date for our annual council PTA Honorary Service Awards. Now, the last time we had this luncheon was in 2019, so mm -hmm. it's been a while. Hopefully some of you have maybe attended it in some capacity in the, in the past. But our luncheon will be on Monday, May 8th at 11 a.m. at the Church of Latter-day Saints off Dover near Newport High School. Um, you're gonna receive an email from our Vice President of Programs, April Money, and we do hope to see you there to uh, celebrate all the amazing volunteers from across our Newport Mesa PTA. So each school recognizes, you know, three to four to five um, exceptional volunteers each year. Membership year to date. Our council currently here in Newport Mesa, the Harbor Council, we have 6,430 members. And our fourth district PTA membership is over 99,000, uh, which is actually up by 8,000 members already this year. So the power of the PTA is certainly here among us um, in the Orange County area. Of course, it's never too late to join the PTA. So if any of you are not PTA members, which I'm sure you are, but anyone here in the crowd, if you're not, please, I encourage you to join your school's PTA. Finally, I just wanted to mention that today was CDM's PTA annual fundraiser, which was a home tour. It's their annual um, main fundraiser, and they featured seven homes today. It was a sold-out event, and hopefully many of you uh, were able to come and participate. So this concludes the Harbor Council PTA update for this month. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have NMFT President Rhonda Reed. Good afternoon, President Anderson, trustees, cabinet, Superintendent Smith, and guests here tonight. 
Um, before I have my short message, I have to say, TJ, very well said. As a former counselor at CDM, could not agree more with him. The past couple of weeks, we have been working on our temporary and probationary members who received their notice of non-relect and non-renewal. And we appreciate the opportunity of these employees that has been given by the district to protect their employment history as they move forward with their careers. It's important to mention that again, there seems to be a larger number of special education teachers in this group as with the past years. We are concerned with the things that these members have said about their work experience as a special education employee. We have raised these concerns in meetings and encouraged the district um, has, has acknowledged that they will consider having exit interviews as we've encouraged them to do. So we appreciate that. And this week, we, um, the Teacher of the Year Committee and teacher volunteers are completing the reading of this year's applications. We will then conduct our classroom observation interviews for the top candidates for the county teachers of the year. So we'll be announcing the results of Teacher of the Year very soon. Thank you. Thank you, CSEA President Stu Tedford. Board President Anderson, trustees, Superintendent Smith, cabinet, esteemed guests. Um, I want to thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, got a couple of things I'd like to bring up. Um, I'd like to first thank our members, uh, the CSEA classified staff, for all they do for our students. Um, we know that when we start at the chalkboard, um, everybody benefits, and so that's our, our new mantra is that, uh, that we are student-centric and going forward. Um, I want to thank um, all of you um, for the uh, labor management initiative and the meetings that are coming up. The response that I got, like I said last time we spoke, was just amazing from my people, and I have um, emails coming in daily about wanting to participate in the next couple of sessions, even though we're going to re-invite. Um, it is something that my members value, and I wanted to thank you all for that and to consider us for um, what I consider to be a valuable interaction between the board and all of our uh, and administrators and teachers and classified staff. It's really important to build those relationships. Um, in relation to that, we have our ACE Day coming up, and I would like to encourage all of you to clear the date. As soon as I get it, I'll let you know. It may be out there. I don't know what it is. But I'd love for all of you to consider participating because that's another way that my members really get mm -hmm. to know what you do and who you are as people and as board trustees and the valuable work that you do on behalf of our students. It relates right back to them because that's what we do every day. We're in there um, serving the students and uh, we know that you work very hard and it just makes a great relationship when they understand you better and maybe if you understand us a little better too, who knows. Um, and last, but certainly not least, I would like to introduce my new public relations officer, Miss Ann Terry. She's an instructional aide at College Park, and we all know, as we just heard, how important our instructional aides are and how stretched thin they all are and how we are all working very diligently to find a solution to that uh, situation. So I want to thank you for all of that, too. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening, and uh, thank you very much. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items not on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on non-agenda topics are limited to three minutes per comment up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish her or his time to another person. By order of the Brown Act, section 54954.2, the board will take no action nor have any discussion on non-agendized items. The superintendent may provide clarification during superintendent's comments. Okay. First up, we have Kristen Seaburn. Hi, President Anderson and trustees and uh, Superintendent Smith. 
Um, I just wanted to talk to you guys today and uh, remind you that you have the power to influence children for generations to come. Today I ask you to stand for something, uh, something that does not necessarily reflect what the state is recommending you go along with. This takes courage and research and an open mind. Um, Senate Bill 659 effectively takes away informed consent for students to receive a secondary education in California. You're paying a lobbyist to influence the district stance on issues that matter to the taxpayers of this district. We have um, an issue that will affect the bodies and minds of every child injected with a vaccine with no chance of contagion uh, of HPV at a school. There, you can't get HPV at school. You can't. So to require this for kids is, is ridiculous. How many of you up there are up to date on your vaccinations? If you're 35 or older, you've had fewer vaccinations in your lifetime than the average six month old baby has had this year. So, this is the vaccine schedule. I don't know if you guys have all had 72 of them or plus. So um, why are you willing to withhold an education from children due to non-compliance to the schedule when you are not up to date? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure none of you have had all 72. Each of you can choose to put your head in the sand and be complicit or stand up and take a position on the informed consent of every parent and child in Newport Mesa. I ask you again to stand for something. The district could be a leader in speaking for thousands of children. The lobbyist should be at the front door of every senator tomorrow advocating for our children and opposing SB 689. Otherwise, the excuse will be that we're just doing our job, just like Nazi Germany. So where does this end? I assure you that there will be a day where they'll require you to take a shot that you don't need or want. So I ask you to take a stand for something and oppose SB 659 by directing the lobbyist to, uh, contracted by Newport Mesa USD. Thank you. Um, next up we have Erica Villapano. Good evening, NMUSD board. My name is Erica Villalpando. February 9th, 2023, California AB 659 Cancer Prevention Act, aka HPV vaccine mandate bill was introduced in legislation for all male and female California public and private school kids grades eight through 12. AB 659 will add HPV to the school schedule of vaccinations and prohibit in admitting or advancing any pupil to the eighth grade level if the pupil has not been fully immunized with HPV. AB 659 would also allow for the California Department of Health Authority, not elected officials, to use HPV-related regulations for students below the eighth grade level. California would be the first state to have an HPV vaccine mandate with no per personal belief, no religious exemption, or functional medical exemption. Parents, I repeat, there are no exemptions, and your student will have to get the Gardasil vaccine to receive an education your taxes pay for, or homeschool, or move out of state. Legislators will tell you that there will be a medical exemption available. That is not true, and that's only on paper, because Senate Bill 276 that passed in 2019 um, do says that doctors who write five or more medical exemptions uh, will be flagged, investigated, and reported to the medical board for review. Therefore, no doctor will rightfully bring attention and jeopardize their license or practice. So board members, why are we adding another obstacle to be able to go to school? Access rather than mandates. Support vaccination rates without risk of further impacting their enrollment rates. Mandated vaccinations and removal of exemptions have been a contributing factor for a concerning decrease in school enrollment. Rates across the state have been in decline since 2014, losing over 300,000 students in less than a decade. AB 659 is not an equitable bill. In order to ensure a robust and diversified student rep population, the focus should be on minimal requirements for school enrollment. School is compulsory and must be easily accessible for all children in California. Required vaccine policies with limited exemptions have placed barriers for tens of thousands of students to attend public and private school. These types of medical intervention mandates take choice from parents. While adding distrust, skepticism to our education system, HPV is not transmitted in a classroom setting and an HPV vaccine mandate is not necessary to be safe at school. Working to improve cancer prevention with 
without creating additional requirements for school enrollment should be a priority. Over 200 lawsuits have been filed against the HPV vaccine and Merck thus far, considering that there is only one HPV vaccine available, Gardasil, and it is under scrutiny in the courts. That, that is not a good candidate for a statewide mandate. 659 is scheduled to be heard in California State Health Committee on March 15, 2023. Board members, this is not an anti-vax argument, but a parental rights plea and the need to stop mandating extremism. I urge you to use your position, call and write your district and state representatives and tell them to amend the current language of AB 659 or oppose it. Parents are losing faith in our elected leaders who are overstepping their positions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Alicia. Good evening, President Anderson, Superintendent Smith, and trustees. In two weeks, our California, California legislator is set to hear a highly concerning bill, AB 659, in the Health Committee. This bill as previously stated, will require 8th through 12th graders to be vaccinated for HPV to attend school, a forced vaccine for a virus that is not even spread in schools. Imagine that. If this bill passes, a minimum of 700,000 8th through 12th graders in this state will be affected and will be denied an education based on their lack of vaccination, resulting in further educational deficit among California's teens. In this district, that imposition would affect roughly 2,200 students. This would be a significant disadvantage to our ethnically diverse fam families who are known to have a lower vaccine uptake. This governing board has a responsibility to actively advocate fiscal and public policy that supports the district schools and children in the community. Since contracting with Capital Advisors Group LLC in April of 2022, I have yet to see the board be proactive in defining the district's advocacy agenda as required by board policy 1160. Specific to legislation, this policy states that you shall identify issues that affect its schools and the children in its community, establish goals and priorities for legislative advocacy, solicit community input, and adopt legislative positions. I requested that AB 659, as it relates to this policy, be placed on today's agenda. The eight of you have done nothing to justify the use of 4,000 of our taxpayer dollars to pay a lobbyist each month. And now we're paying trustee Bartow, who is participating in legislative committees and advocacy in Sacramento and DC, again on our dime. The public is kept in the dark as to what exactly you are doing, if anything at all, to advocate for our children. You all, again, so far have done nothing to be proactive about any legislative influence. This district is broken and you are failing the next generation. As esteemed former Senator Morlock stated, the NMUSD is a bottom dweller. We rank at the bottom of not only fiscal health, but in academic achievement. The most recent example of failed leadership is the advancement of an elementary principal whose most relevant experience was in the American Red Cross disaster response team between 1984 and 1986 to health services director. This individual now oversees a medical department and will be partly responsible for denying education to students who do not comply with nonsensical state law, though she lacks the fundamental knowledge to have and hold such authority. It is disheartening that the district yields power to the state rather than advocating for local control and in accordance to our board policy. Because of this, I will continue to advocate for the children and will request that you place AB 659 on the March 28th agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Wendy Lees. Good evening, President Anderson and members of the Newport Mesa School Board. My name is Wendy Lees. I have been a parent for 50 years this year. I have been a taxpayer for 50 years, and I sat on this board for eight years as a parent of five children. 
Uh, we started at Harper School. Uh, the, rain, the rain came through the roof, so I sat over here for the groundbreaking. I don't know if anybody else is still around when we broke ground for this building. But those were the days, 94 to 02, when we didn't really have controversial items. Well, a lot has changed. COVID changed all of our lives. We have a new normal. And we used to hire a lobbyist to, to, to deal with the finances in Sacramento. Fine. Now we are asking that, that the lobbyists go and represent the community. I'm sure you're familiar with page section three, financial 76. And that says that the amount of property taxes in this uh, community total 429, 497, 842 million dollars. I'm a taxpayer. This is a new day. Taxpayers have a right to lobby you to, to send a message that this community, just like we didn't want whole language in 95, 96, and, and we won, we want you to pay Kevin Gordon to go up there to represent those of us who are critical thinkers, just like we want our students to be, and represent us. Now, maybe you say, well, we don't want to do that. I know how this works. You, because the superintendent or somebody says, oh, we've never done that before. We don't t do, deal with controversial issues. Well, it's time that you do. It's time that you put it on the agenda and debate it, okay? If you get four votes, send them up there to represent this community. If you don't, we lose, okay? But the burden would be on us to argue why our tax dollars, millions of dollars, should go and represent us in Sacramento on this very controversial issue that will affect children's lives. Most of you are mothers. And, and do you want to put your daughter at risk for this vaccine? You would? Well, I disagree. Please consider putting this, it's been asked for, it's under the, you have that uh, discretion to put it on the agenda. What, what are you afraid of? in this community, in a conservative community. Let us argue why you should send Kevin Gordon to Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will have our superintendent's comments. Yeah, no clarifications with people's urging. They accurately reflected what they're urging folks to do. Uh, there was a statement that the state is recommending we go along with something. That, I think that was corrected by the group. The state isn't recommending anything right now. It hasn't been heard yet. Uh, the board has messaged that they're aware that it's early in the session. They're following the bill. Uh, there's also mention of BP 1160. The board's aware of that recommendation or request, rather official request, to be more accurate, uh, to agendize this legislative platform. So they're aware of that. I, uh, I would say that... Um, the suggestion that our work with capital advisors bearing no fruit so far is inaccurate in the millions of dollars, uh, but I respect people's opinion to disagree. The arts and block grant money that was initially going to be doled out by an LCFF model would cut out all of our community funded districts in the state. They took that up on our behalf, millions of dollars, and now the state wants to deficit that money because they want to fund some other programs, and they're fighting for that. I think the addition of $12 million in this district warrants uh, more than what we're paying capital advisors, and we're grateful for their efforts. Otherwise, I have no clarifications. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any input on agenda items? Thank you. Okay. Do you want me to read? Yes, please. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Speaker cards for items on a discussion action calendar may be held until that item is considered by the board if the speaker so prefers. Would you like to do your comment now or when we do the CTE item? May I wait? Yeah, absolutely. Just wanted to offer. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Next up, we have our report on early learning. John Jake. Yes, thank you, uh, President Anderson, uh, Dr. Smith, board members. Um, I'm excited to call up our um, early learning team, uh, consisting of, uh, at the lead, 
uh, Dr. Lori Hernandez, uh, T our Director of Teaching and Learning, and Kathleen Leary, our Director of Early Learning and Expanded Programs. Um, we have taken very seriously our priority number one of increasing achievement um, across the district throughout our grade levels um, to pre-pandemic levels. Um, we've made a conscious decision uh, to really start um, early, right? Start with our pre-school kids. Um, and expand through third grade and then up into to fifth and sixth grade and, and so on. Um, th these uh, two leaders have done a fantastic job putting a group together of a P3 team to really look at how we can impact uh, achievement. Um, so they're gonna share with you um, the intentional plans that have been implemented um, the results of the early results of those plans, and they're looking very positive, as well as where we go from here. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Hernandez. Good evening, President Anderson, members of the board, Superintendent Smith, staff, and guests. We're excited tonight to share with you the work we're doing with our youngest learners. Starting with our board priorities, board priority one and two are directly addressed in the work we're doing for a strong start in Newport Mesa. You'll hear tonight how our team has focused on strengthening early literacy practices and expanding whole child support. We're gonna to start tonight with information about our pre-kindergarten programs, including how we've provided teacher training, expanded TK, and how we use data to inform our actions. Then we'll share information about our PK3 literacy team, which is a committee focused on our P3 continuum, specific to early literacy instruction and assessment. Kathleen Leary is gonna start us off. Good evening. Oops. Sorry. So I begin with the very beginning of the P3, which is um, our pre-kindergarten. Uh, the goal of our pre-kindergarten programs is to contribute to the children's learning and development and subsequently prepare them to be successful in kindergarten and elementary school as well as beyond. Uh, we feel that it's essential component of P3 continuum and it gives our children a st strong start. Oops, sorry. When we talk about pre-kindergarten, we are referring to all of the learning that happens in our programs prior to kindergarten. So we have state and tuition preschools as well as um, our TK programs. Uh, the, in NMUSD, our preschools, both state and tuition, serve our three and four year olds, and our TK serves four year olds. And then the P part really goes and expands all the way to zero to five. And we have been focusing at, to, to do some parent involvement and, and kindergarten readiness with our families. And I'm going to call up right now um, Myra Marin. She's right here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> our wonderful Myra Marin from Newport L, and she's going to talk about our earliest learning and all the magic that happens in her. Good evening. Um, teaching our little ones is truly my passion. I enjoy every minute I get to spend in the classroom with my students. Um, and I've also learned to value the time that I spend outside of the classroom attending trainings. I am so fortunate to work for a, a wonderful district that provides us with so many trainings. Um, such as the, you know, I attended the Hegarty training, Thinking Maps, and the Moonlight um, series that Kathleen and Michelle put together. I'm also part of the PK3, the P3 Literacy Committee, in which I not only not have have I not only collaborated with members of our committee, but I've also learned so much about the importance of literacy in which I have been able to take back into my classroom. I walk in every day and put myself in their shoes and think about, I see them as a whole and I wanna make sure that I'm providing them with everything that they need um, to be able to work on the learning to learn skills. Um, if you were to visit my classroom, you would see how literacy is implemented, and not just in, at my literacy center, but throughout the classroom. You would walk in and see our dramatic area switched up into a dentist's office and see children intaking patients and um, writing prescriptions and um, reading labels. You would go into the block area and see engineers and architects drawing blueprints uh, for their building. You would go to the science area and see children, see our little scientists um, drawing and writing observations from living 
things in the, in the um, science area. Every single area within our classroom works on all their developmental areas uh, to make sure that they are ready for kindergarten, but we're also focusing on the child as a whole. Um, being part of the PK3 committee has also allowed me to focus on my lessons that have to do with um, on a weekly lesson and also make sure that I am providing all the opportunities that these children need at this age. Um, I, as a teacher, I also make sure that I'm exposing these little ones to our outside world. Um, just recently, we finished the whole theme of community workers in which we invited families to come in and show children the kind of work that they do. We had a PA, we had a doctor, we had a firefighter. We, we even had a meteorologist from Fox 11 Zoom with us and teach these little ones about the different career options out there. Um, a story that I shared with Kathleen was a little one said, Mrs. Marin, I told my mom that I never want to leave you, but she said I have to go to college um, because I, I need to be, I'm going to be a CEO when I got to go to college. And then she came back the next day and said, Mrs. Marin, my mom said I really do need to go to college, so you're coming with me instead. Um, <laughs> So uh, my, my job as a, as a teacher is really making sure that I'm providing these experiences to these little ones from an early age, um, specifically when it comes to literacy. literacy. And I'm going to leave you with this quick story. Um, a parent walked up to me at the end of the year one year, and with teary eyes, she said, Mrs. Marin, um, it is true. There is magic in your classroom. And I, I talked about what, what is that magic, and she said, um, as I was searching uh, for preschools within our area, I met a former parent, and she looked at me and said, you, you need to put your child on the wait list for New Portel. And she said, well, why? Why would I pick New Portel or any of our New Promesa schools? And she said, I can't explain that. You have to live that magic yourself. And she, with teary eyes, she said, I, I, we live that magic. And when she talked about that magic, this is exactly what it is. Uh, for us to be able to provide a fun, engaging, love, and safe environment for these little ones from an early start. Thank you so much. Thank you. And my room is truly magical. It really mm. is. Sorry. So um, just a little bit about, about our pre-kindergarten programs. We have a variety. We have th a lot of choices for families, and that is really the goal. We have a continuum. We have part-day preschools, uh, as well as full-day preschool at two of our sites. Those full-day preschools go 246 days, so they go all summer. They go through winter break, spring break. They're only closed when our district is closed, so they go all day in 246 days. We also have a special ed, gen ed inclusion um, preschool program over at College Park. Uh, we have four tuition preschools at Davis, Harborview, Newport Coast, and Newport L. And lastly, we have, I'm very excited that we were able to open um, TKs at all of our elementary schools. So we have 20 sites that have TK. Some have more than one classroom. And um, we know that we're going to grow even more next year because we're adding two more months. So it will, students will be eligible if they have a birth date between September 2nd and April 2nd. Um, lastly, I just want to talk about a little bit about um, our Moonlight series, which is a part of the P3. And really... Um, one of the things that we did this year is really focus on early literacy, knowing the board's goal of early literacy, as well as the assessment of student learning. But we really wanted to focus because um, the moonlight is with our pre-K, TK teachers, along with our gen ed and special ed teachers. So everybody's included and they can come after school and, and get the PD training. Um, also developmentally appropriate practices, but importantly, really looking at our learning environments. Myra outlined it very well of what her classroom looks like with all of the various centers. But we know with early literacy, we talk about the phonological awareness. We talk about um, oral language. But one of the things that we also know is really important is those learning to learn skills. And so we have met with teachers um, especially TK teachers, to talk about the setup of their classroom. So it is providing a structure so students are learning those learning to learn skills as well as for them to model that. 
Um, measuring kindergarten readiness. Um, this is something that we have been doing in Newport Mesa for many years. Um, it is called the Early Developmental Index. And as you know, uh, research has found that kindergarten readiness is an indicator for uh, future academic and social success. As a part of the Ch Children and Families Commission, which is now First Five Orange County, we are a part of the EDI and all of our kindergarten teachers um, do this EDI, uh, the surveys on all of their children. Um, the data is aggravated, so aggregated. So one of the things is it's not, we don't see it by student level. What we look is at the community and the neighborhood level. And really, it's really important so it, we can decide what we need to do with you know, parents and the community from zero to five to make sure kids are ready for kindergarten, as well as in our preschool and TK classrooms. It's not reported, like I said, at the child level, and we don't use it for diagnostics. So we never see what the uh, student score is. And NMUSD was a leader in um, the EDI collection. We were the first in Orange County, and now all schools in Orange County do the EDI. So how do we measure, um, how does it measure school readiness? It looks at physical health and well-being, emotional maturity, communication skills and general knowledge, language and cognitive development, as well as social confidence. Now I outlined or circled two of the categories that they did a, through UCLA, they did a predict, predicted, predictability study to show how they correlate with scores on the SBAC. And what they found is that all of them show a prediction of SBAC, but those two areas have the strongest correlation, which is language and cog cognitive development, as well as communication skills and general knowledge. So in Newport Mesa, these are the developmental areas. And for the most part, the, when you look at the, at the big areas, our students are coming in um, you know, pretty proficient and ready to learn in kindergarten. <laughs> Um, in all the areas. But what I want to point out are the various sub areas. So where we're doing well is our literacy skills, which are, for instance, if the students know, you know, 10 or more letters, if they're able to handle a book, if they ha can read simple letters or simple um, words, as well as if they're interested in writing. Um, and then the basic numeracy, students come in with really strong skills and, and you know, they are able to identify uh, numbers one through 10, they have one-to-one -one correspondence, and so they come in pretty strong with those skills. Where we could use, look for some improvement, um, now when you look at this, this is a district level, of, and it's taken into account all of our schools, but when I looked at it and looked at every single school, every school has these vulnerabilities, and these students come in with the same vulnerabilities. So communication skills and general knowledge, that one is um, their ability to do imaginative play, to tell a story, um, to communicate in English, um, and uh, to be able to express their needs. Gross and fine motor skills is their ability to manipulate a pencil, maybe to manipulate objects, their ability to be energized throughout the day that they don't grow tired. Uh, Pro-social and helping behavior, those are all of those friendship skills, being able to cooperate, helping others. And then overall so social competence, really looking at self-regulation. Are they able to follow um, directions and, and listen to the teacher? So we see that those are the areas that we are working on in preschool and TK, as well as sharing the information with uh, the, the elementary so that they know what they can do for intervention. So this is a map that I wanted to share with you. and. Um, I can get you a copy that so that you can look at it in particular. But what is interesting and what you can see from this is that our students throughout the whole district come in with a variety of, of um, kindergarten readiness. So the light gray are those students that come in 61% or greater uh, ready for kindergarten. The light blue or the dark gray is 54 to 60% of students are ready for kindergarten. Uh, the medium blue, 46 to 53%. Uh, 
Uh, dark blue is 39 to 45% of the students are ready for kindergarten. And the darkest blue is 38 um, or less are ready for kindergarten. So as you see, there are various areas and we, we have areas that we can be working on in our preschools and our TK as we get ready for um, getting our students ready for kindergarten. So what we do with the EDI data, as I mentioned, is we look back. What can we do in our preschool and TK classrooms so that we can better grow those fine and gross motor skills, the communication, um, general communication skills, um, and then looking forward, it kind of provides a roadmap so that we can provide targeted intervention and support. And I'm going to be turning it over to Gabe, Gabe DeReal from Harborview, who's going to talk about as we move forward in um, our pre-3. Good evening. I'm honored to be a member of the P3 committee and to be able to share with you some of the work that the committee is engaged in um, this evening. As someone who started my career working with children in the two-year-old room at Cal State Fullerton's Children's Center, uh, this work is near and dear to my heart. Um, I was able to join the P3 team when it started last school year. And uh, looking at this literacy progression, um, this is really a guide in how it's directing some of the work that we're doing and really a, enabling us to ensure robust systems for tier one, tier one instruction, assessment, and intervention in all aspects of literacy. When we, when we look at the work of the P3 team, it's clearly connected to the board priority of improving academic achievement in literacy. And while we know helping children age three through eight develop literacy skills is imperative, this guide helps and is very enlightening in identifying the individual aspects of literacy. So by identifying those aspects of literacy, we can clarify the success criteria for our students and also identify the areas of needed intervention. So rather than saying this child is struggling while learning to read, we can say this child is struggling with phonological awareness, the middle section, the middle blue section in this diagram. And so what does that mean? It means a child may be hearing, when a child hears a sentence, we can build a house, they're able to identify that there are five words in that sentence. And, or um, if they take the word house, in one of our TK classrooms, one of the activities that I saw is the teacher says the word house and the students say, ow, s, and they have a total physical response to that. They think they're playing a game, but really they're developing this cornerstone of their ability to map the written symbols on the page to the sounds that they're hearing in words. So you can see how this work is illuminating what we do as a P3 committee. So on this next slide, I want to share with you a little background um, about the P3 committee itself and how it got started. Initially, the P3 committee uh, started work in February 2022, and it was originally set for the purpose of working on the TK expansion plan. Knowing that TK was going to be expanding this school year, it was a tall order. Quickly, the plan shifted then to focus on literacy throughout preschool through third grade. The team has met seven times, and there have been various subcommittees that have um, come out of the P3 work in areas <coughs> like assessment. Representatives from the following groups are included. Pre uh, the preschool team, including teachers, the dyslexia specialist team, English language arts, TOSAs, ELD TOSAs, special ed TOSAs, ed services, and, and the elementary team. A minimum of one principal per zone, the multi-tiered systems of support team, the Department of Assessment and Data Analysis, and primary grade teachers were added this year. So you can see it's a, it's a large room, it's a full house. The overarching goals of the team are to strengthen the instruction and assessment in early literacy and to ensure all students become readers by grade three. 
One way that that's achieved is by building capacity in the science of reading, so through professional development for our teachers. Another goal is to provide district-wide consistency in assessment and instruction, and to provide comprehensive and targeted supports to students. So to share some more information about this, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Hernandez. So we've taken a lot of action in this past year. It's been a busy year. We trained all of our teachers in PK to grade two in phonemic awareness, and we provided the Hegarty phonemic awareness daily lessons to all of our teachers, and all of our students are getting those lessons daily. Um, all of our full-time support teachers and many of our special education teachers and TOSAs are going through letters training, which is an extensive two-year science of reading training, which stands for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. This training is building capacity and helping to inform some of the work we're doing with early literacy. Additionally, our full-time support teachers piloted a variety of diagnostic assessments for early literacy and provided input that we're using now to roll out some district-wide assessments for next year. But our work is not done. Um, we have some next steps, which includes rolling out uh, some new assessments that I just um, talked about, which includes checkpoint diagnostic assessments to more frequently monitor students, continuing to train our teachers in the science of reading, and then evaluating our phonics approach in tier one and two, um, the same way we did with phonemic awareness, really breaking apart those literacy skills and evaluating what we're doing in those areas. And when we say the science of reading, um, we use this image of Scarborough's rope, and this is a framework for how kids learn to read. So the bottom of the rope, the word level skills, are those early literacy skills that all kids must have in order to learn to read. So these things must be directly taught. We must directly teach kids that sounds, you know, letters make sounds, that makes up words. And so even before a child can decode text, though, they're also learning language, building vocabulary. So both of those things must be intact in order for a child to become a skilled reader. So what we're working on in our P3 committee is that bottom part of the rope, really making sure that all of our kids have all of those skills, phonological awareness, decoding, all of those skills. And you might be thinking, how do we know if our kids are acquiring those skills? So we measure progress in early literacy using our Acadians test, which used to be called Dibbles. We use those terms interchangeably. So measuring the skills on the bottom of the rope is essential to make sure all kids have all those building blocks to become readers. So we use it as a universal screener. Um, and we use this assessment three times a year. It's a tool, sort of a, a checkpoint, to make sure all kids are on track with phonemic awareness and phonics. We can also identify students who already have mastered those skills and are ready to become readers of text. And so I'm gonna share what, an example of what that assessment looks like so you can get an idea of what our teachers and students are, are doing when they take that assessment. So this is a sample from first grade of a nonsense word assessment. So we use this to assess whether or not students are actually using sounds to read words as opposed to memorizing whole words. So this is how we can tell if kids know their sounds and can actually use them to read. So you might take a word like PIM, it's not a real word, P-I-M, and they have to actually use their sounds. We tell them these are made up words. We, we don't tell them these are real words. We tell them these are you know nonsense words or pretend words. And we have kids read them because if we used a word like dog or cat, you have kids that have memorized that word. And that doesn't tell us if they can then take the word cat and decode catastrophic, right? So we wanna make sure that kids are reading words they've never seen before to know if they know how to actually use sounds to read words. So we've seen some big gains since fall. From fall to winter, we saw a 9% increase in students meeting the benchmark in the nonsense word fluency measure. And even more exciting, we have 77% of our students meeting their mid-year first grade fluency benchmark. This is the highest it's ever been since we started using a cadence in 2015. So we're really proud of that. That means more of our first graders are becoming readers, which is essential. We really want them meeting that fluency benchmark by the end of first grade, and we still have half of the school year. So we have a lot of time for that other 23%. So this is really promising. In kindergarten, we use a cadence as well. Um, so this is an assessment of first sound fluency. Kids don't actually see any text. They could be blindfolded. This is completely oral between the teacher and student. So what happens in this assessment 
is the teacher would say the word laughed and the student has to identify ol as the beginning sound. So this is assessing whether or not they can hear that there are different sounds making up a word. And so this assesses phonemic awareness. We're also pretty excited about these results. So th these are results from, from fall to winter. We assess this at the start of the year, then we assess it at a mid-year checkpoint. We had the highest growth in first sound fluency ever since we started using this measure. So the average growth from fall to winter that we've seen over, since 2015 when we've been keeping this data is about 7% or 8% in our Title I schools. And this year we grew 11% and 18.5% in our Title I schools. So we're pretty proud of that. That means kids are coming in. They might not have had a full preschool experience. They might not have had some of those skills at the beginning, but they've made pretty massive gains this year. So more of our kindergartners are progressing through kindergarten with strong phonemic awareness, which is helping them be ready for some of those next level skills like phonics and actually reading. So more kindergartners than ever before are on track to become readers. And one school in particular um, that showed exceptional growth from fall to winter was Wilson Elementary. And Dr. Heckard and one of her outstanding teachers are here to speak to a couple of actions they put in place at their school. Good evening, members of the board and uh, President Anderson, Superintendent Smith, hello. Um, I'd like to, I'm Jennifer Hecker, um, pre uh, Principal at Wilson, and this is um, an amazing first grade teacher, Mr. Isander Gutierrez. So I'm gonna speak just for a moment and then I'm gonna let him also speak to you um, about what he's doing in his classroom with Hegarty. Um, I'm really excited and honored to be here um, on behalf of Wilson Elementary, um, our team, it is definitely, a coordinated team effort with everybody working together to get these results. So I'm just incredibly proud of everybody's hard work and dedication. So just to let you know a few things about our curriculum. So in our tier one, and I'm gonna just speak to K2 right now, cause that's primarily like our early literacy um, areas that we're focusing on. So um, tier one, we have our daily whole group lessons in our uh, evidence-based curriculum of wonder. So we're using that daily. We're also using our Hegarty that you keep hearing about right now, this PA that we've integrated into our tier one, everybody daily, it's about 10 to 12 minutes. Um, we also do um, small group instruction. And this is with the, our teachers. We've, we've also worked heavily with our ELD TOSAs. We do are really fortunate. Two of our ELD TOSAs actually live at Wilson. Of course, they service the whole district, but they're at Wilson. And so they've really uh, built these incredible relationships with our teachers. So they are coming also into our K-1 um, classrooms. And we've got some really great reading um, centers and rotations going. Um, we're also using Lexia with our new district guidelines. So we're using that in class a little bit now and we're definitely at home. Um, and then tier two. So all K through two students at Wilson get tier two. We have an additional 30 minutes of uh, targeted differentiated instruction daily. And um, we work with our amazing reading support team. We have two full-time reading teachers. We have three part-time reading teachers, as well as working with our K2 teachers. Everybody is involved in this uh, every morning. We have it set very deeply into our schedule. Um, we do that. Um, also, we have um, our daily ELD leveled rotations for all grade levels as well. So we do 30 minutes of, of teachers. Um, our full-time reading support teachers are involved in that. Sometimes the TOSAs come in and get involved in it. They have been coaching us a lot, working with us with progress monitoring data this year. So again, it's a definitely a team effort with, I feel like the ELA, the tier one, the tier two with our ELD rotations every single day. So it's really um, paying off some great dividends. Um, also, I just want to talk about our full-time support teachers. Whoo, wow, they are so awesome. We are so grateful for them. <laughs> they do so much at our schools, um, not only professional development around Hegarty and letters and the science of reading, which is amazing, um, but again, they're involved in our ELG rotations. They're delivering instruction. They're involved in our daily tier two rotations. So they're, they're doing so much for um, our school. We're so grateful and our part-time team as well. Um, again, Shout out to the ELD TOSAs. They've really been helping our school as well. So all of this is going very well, but the bottom line is it's a highly coordinated team effort at Wilson, and I'm just so happy and excited to be able to work with everybody. I'm going to let you, Xander, uh, speak to you a little bit. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Xander Gutierrez. I'm very nervous, so pardon me if I slip up a little bit. Um, <laughs> I'm one of two uh, first grade teachers over at Wilson, um, this being my second year at Wilson, but my first in first grade. So it's, it's all been learning, it's all been, you know, uh, 
traveling uphill. And uh, it's been a struggle, but it's been a, a very rewarding experience. Um, in the beginning, um, I think as with anything, um, Hegarty was seemed like a daunting thing to try to have to learn like another uh, curriculum on top of everything else that we're doing. Um, so at the beginning, we didn't, I, thought, I don't think we used it, utilized it as it was intended. So it was, kids had a hard time. Our lessons were 20 to 25 minutes long and it was just felt impossible to do every, anything in 10 to 12 minutes. Um, now that um, we got better, like with, with anything, more practice means you get better at it. So now my little, um, you know, my little scholars are, you know, they're able to do the work that I didn't think was possible um, after so much time. You know, it's been, I think, going on three, to four, um, three or four months, and now they're avid in this, you know, to, they're able to manipulate words, um, add sounds, delete sounds, change sounds, and mind you, it's still a struggle, and we still are learning as we go, but it's been, as you can see by, you know, the latest uh, trimester results for Acadians that um, it's worked wonders uh, for us. Um, obviously, nothing's perfect, so uh, Hegarty has really blended well with the rest of the things that we're utilizing, I think, with SIPs and the wonders uh, core curriculum, curriculum that we use for, you know, in general, um, it really has worked together nicely. And I think, as Dr. Hackard said, it's just been like a very coordinated, structured effort. And I'm finding that <laughs> mid-year that we are seeing that it's not for nothing. And um, I'm just very proud of them. And um, thank you for the opportunity to share our school's experience with you. And again, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for uh, being able to provide these learning experiences for us, this evidence-based curriculum for us. We are so grateful to all of you, and thank you to you for your vision, everybody's vision with us. We're very grateful. Thank you. And looking forward to the future, more growth. Thank you. So uh, what is next for us? So we are for sure, we're celebrating all of this growth in our students. And we know that we have more students than ever on track to become proficient readers. Um, and then we do want to say the work is not done. So we are continuing the P3 Literacy Committee, looking at other areas of literacy, looking into second and third grade. So once we get the kids reading, now what comes next? So we will continue to do that. We will continue to strengthen the Hegarty implementation, make sure any new teachers get trained, make sure it continues to be a routine in our classrooms. Um, the TOSAs are gonna continue supporting teachers and um, our P3 literacy team, um, like I said before, we're looking at assessment, we're looking at what comes next with professional development for teachers and all of those kind of things. So at this time, uh, Kathleen and I are happy to take questions. Trustee Crane. Yes, that was an exceptional report, thank you. Um, if anything, I see so much passion and knowledge, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, I had a question on um, the 2022 NMSUS, NMUSD EDI map. Um, as, as far as the data, is this what what percentage are of this data is from students that are from our feeder preschool and TK classes, or is or is it from private preschools or no schooling at all? So it's a combination because we have okay. all of our students that come into kindergarten. Um, I can get you the information as far as uh, how many of the percentage of our kids that go to preschool, go to one of our, our uh, kindergarten classes, but it is not broken down by preschool. Um, we have asked through UCLA that mm -hmm. that is a possibility that they can tease that out in the future. Do, do you see a difference that our feeder school kids have a better transition as far as kindergarten readiness? Absolutely, yes. Um, we, that was the reason of my, for my question. I yes. wanted to kind of... No, absolutely. We do see... Uh, not only are they part of the schools, because uh, many times they go to the same preschool that they're at the home school that they are going to attend, K through 6. Um, and so they already feel a part of the school. They already know what the mm -hmm. rules are, and they already know uh, the teachers and the principal, and so they feel <coughs> comfortable with that transition. On top of that, they have been receiving... We are very intentional in bringing along our preschool and TK teachers and meeting with the kindergarten teachers so that we can really address those areas that kindergarten teachers 
say we can if they had x y and z mm -hmm. they would be able to go up off and running in kindergarten so okay and then uh, you know part of that the well fabulous early Acadian scores that's amazing congratulations to all of our teachers who are trying so hard and staff uh, and then the p3 i heard i loved hearing about the p3 literacy team that actually in, involves a lot of the different aspects of what makes kids successful um, and Early assessment is so important, especially if we are able to detect behavioral or learning disabilities, because then we're catching it early. And I know uh, Trustee Barto and I were up in Sacramento, and um, it's on the radar of a lot of legislators. I know Senator Portentino, I think, SB 691, he, he, he's, uh, uh, he's sponsoring a bill that does dys dyslexia uh, screening. And that's coming from Sacramento, so that can only help us in early detection because that's just so important. So thank you for the great work. Trustee Bartow? Yes, I just wanted to thank your team for all the hard work. Um, one of the things when we were up with PTA uh, the, the, in Sacramento that they talked about was how uh, states that have a requirement for science-based uh, reading um, as the method of instruction do so much better and how California does not have that requirement. So it's wonderful that we are taking that on um, and being a leader in that way. And um, I know it's a lot of work for you. So thank you very much. Trustee Murphy. Um, yeah, no, obviously this is really great. And, um, but I guess I, I'm just a little bit concerned again with that EDI map, the, the clusters there. Is there any thoughts on those lower scores? Um, on on what more we could be? Do you have any thoughts on more what more yes. we could be doing a to help help that community and parent outreach? That's some mm -hmm. of our next steps. Is really um, looking at how we can go out and we've partnered with Hogue in the past in the past prior to COVID, and we're looking to do that again. Where well, we have the Costa Mesa yes preschool I, uh, early early yep childhood ed yep, thing coalition yep. right. Mm -hmm. and we're looking to see if we can resurrect that as well as. Really, how do we get out to the community? How do we get out to parents to show that they are partners in the education of their students? They're the first teachers mm -hmm. of our children. And that really is a goal of ours to really look at how we, that zero to three, also let them know about our preschool programs. Yeah. Many, pro many parents don't know about our preschool programs. And they're, you know, right now starting to register as four year olds because they're getting their you know, mm -hmm. right now getting ready mm -hmm. for kindergarten and, and when they register in March, it's almost a little late. It so. feels like one of the emails I send out the most to mm -hmm. new residents in Costa Mesa. Preschool. Yes. Here's preschool. Yeah. So, yes. yeah. If we could do, you know, banner ads or something. Yeah. <laughs> Fly nice. yeah. Thank you. It's really good work. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, yes. Kind of following up a bit on what trustee Murphy was saying. Um, Trustee Ursulu and I as well, the three of us were part of the Early Childhood um, Costa Mesa Coalition. Um, and I saw on here, there's one of the sections that says, look, looking back, facilitating community mobilization to create an action agenda centered around improving outcomes. Um, and as Early Childhood OC is kind of on a hiatus, are, are there plans to create a, a Newport Mesa one and push that information out? Yes, there is. And in fact, I met with our special ed team um, yesterday or the day before. How can we jointly work together to do parent involvement and really push down to zero to three as well? Um, really looking at those kindergarten readiness skills as it relates to oral language and communication and show, you know, giving parents resources on how to read to their children and how to ask questions, all of those things. Uh, we do continue to have a kindergarten readiness website. Unfortunately, they get to learn about that when they come to our TKK orientation. But, you know, we are going to be looking at our next steps is to reaching out to the community and what can we do to, to educate the community about things that they can do just to simple things, you know, counting the forks as they're getting ready for dinner, you know, as they're doing laundry, pairing the socks and talking about colors. There's so many things that parents can do with just things that they have in their house. So. Do you know, are we still doing the kind of kindergarten readiness calendar that yes, had something do. every day? Mm -hmm. Do I wonder if there's a way to maybe put that at the Costa Mesa library so then there's a connection with 
the school district and the library because I, I like know a that. lot of people take those and they're bilingual. Um, and I know there's almost, I think, every single one of us has a passion for early education. And so I, I really thank you for um, taking our priorities seriously <laughs> and really of doing course. such incredible work. Um, and I just was wondering, too, if we're using some of our principles. Like I know Ray is having similar success. So using some of the principles who are having a lot of this success, are they cross-training some of our other principles? Yeah, we do collaborate. We have a monthly elementary principal meeting and we just actually we just had it yesterday and we dug in collaboratively looking at this data, talking about next steps with teachers. So it's a constant conversation with our all of our principals working together. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great job. We have one more question. I'm sorry. Um, Trustee Ursula. No, it was just a, a, a comment, suggestion, that uh, you mentioned you were working with um, special education department. Um, I would just offer it to make sure that you're also working with our DLAC team to okay. make sure, because I think um, in a lot of this work, we've seen there are some misconceptions that parents feel like, if I can't read to my kid in English, I won't read to them. But to let everybody know that reading in whatever language you can read in um, is super beneficial and um, to have those opportunities available. Thank you for that suggestion. Thank you. Okay, um, next up we have our report on our facilities master plan update. Mr. Trader? Tonight we have our director of facilities, Otto Wiggins, who will provide a brief update on our facilities master plan. See if I got the right one. Okay, I guess it's in that view. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, trustees, executive cabinet, and our guests. Um, tonight I brought a friend along. This is uh, Brian Leonard. He's with DLR Group, which is our architect that we selected for the master plan and as you know they went through a rigorous process to be selected for that we had over i think 13 or 14 submissions from architects which they were selected to be one of three of our master architects which me which means they can do any project throughout the district as projects arise but we went through a second interview process to select the master plan architect. And so um, they were successful in that uh, process. And so we want to welcome them aboard. We've been doing some work behind the scenes. And so tonight we really just wanted to talk to you about the process that we're going to go through so we can um, just explain to you what the expectations are and the, over, um, the, uh, the overview of the timeline. And so I'm going to let Brian take it away and I'll chime in as needed. <laughs> Hello, thank you for uh, making time for me and for talking about this process. Um, my name is Brian Leonard. Um, I'm an architect, I've been practicing for over 20 years now and my specialty is schools. So I'm, I'm married to an educator, I've got three young children, school is my life. Mm -hmm. So um, I have kind of the unenviable task of trying to uh, simplify and distill down really highly complex problems into things that uh, everybody can understand uh, and try and communicate a process that's really gonna make sense um, of what we're gonna be working through. And so, uh, go to the next slide here. So, this is a, a slide that really talks about a process where we're gonna be taking a tidal wave of information and trying to distill it down into actionable data for, uh, for you, for the facilities team, uh, to start to prioritize uh, what the condition of your facilities are and what types of improvements uh, you're going to need to make over the you know the coming years and decades? Uh, a long-term uh, facilities master plan is a really effective tool, uh, specifically for making decisions because uh, your the condition of your facilities is constantly changing. The needs that your facilities uh, provide for educational outcomes is constantly changing, as we're hearing. And so, really, what we need to do is find out the condition of them, and then begin to talk with all the stakeholders and the educators to make sure that you have a working plan 
that gives you a roadmap for the future. So we've got uh, the process kind of distilled down into the seven tasks. And this is kind of fluid uh, and flexible uh, and changes for every district. But we've done lots of master plans, and this is typically the process we go through. So we're currently in task one, which is research and discovery. We're taking all of your master plan uh, information, all of the as-built drawings of every campus, and uh, researching that and going through and finding out the age of things. And then task two, we're going to be starting uh, pretty soon, which is the facility conditions assessment. And that's where members of our team actually go to every single site and meet with the site users and find out how are things going? Uh, where are things leaking? Uh, where are you guys having problems on the campus? And uh, what do you have as, as hopes and, and things for the, the, the future of your campus? And really, that's just Again, absorbing data. We call it facts and needs, and we start to, to bring that information in. Uh, task three is really starting to work with the educational team, uh, like Dr. Smith and his team, um, and find out what are the educational goals uh, for the district, because uh, we have to really translate what are you hoping to do educationally with what you're hoping to do with facilities and make sure that we can marry those well. Uh, task four is really then taking that information and starting to hear from the community. Um, that we'll have hopefully some regional level meetings where everybody has a chance to hear. So including you guys, uh, I would hope that uh, you would be able to participate in those meetings as well and start to hear what your community is saying about what they want uh, for the conditions of the schools. Then we would work through estimation, um, estimating the costs associated with basic improvements, and then uh, Task six is really once we start to formulate plans, we would have uh, some tools that will help you to prioritize and implement uh, the recommended improvements. And then all of that gets synthesized into a master plan document. Now, historically, a long time ago, when we would produce a master plan document, it would look like just a printed thing that you'd you know, take around with you. Uh, now with technology, it's radically different, and I'm excited to tell you what that looks like. So let's talk about engagement real quick. So um, we've got concentric circles that kind of slowly widen over time. So we've got an executive committee. And the executive committee that is kind of the core of this process is, is ADA and the facilities team, uh, supported by maintenance. And they're going to be in regular communication with uh, Dr. Smith and the executive cabinet um, as is appropriate. And then uh, the second concentric circle is the site committee which is going to be uh, typically uh, administrators. The principal is really key. Uh, APs. Um, Can I add something? Sure, sure. absolutely. So um, as we were developing these committees, we sent out a form to each of the sites for them to respond to who they were going to include in their committee. And so depending on the size of the school, whether it's an elementary school or a high school, will dictate how many people participate. So I just wanted to read you um, one of our high school's responses, and I'm not going to say names, I'm just going to say positions, but we have the principal, we have the assistant principal, we have the head uh, plant manager, we have teacher from the science department, teacher from the PE department, ASN member, a teacher um, slash varsity football coach, PTSA president, athletics director, oops, uh, BAPA department director, activities director, and graduation coach administrative intern. So we're trying to cover our bases and make sure everyone's included. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very robust group. Um, and uh, you know, the, one of the great things about that is it really allows us to, uh, to hear a lot. And that's really important. Um, nobody wants to have a master plan that doesn't represent uh, the voices of your constituents and your community. And groups like that at this, the site level, they are intimately aware of what your facilities are going on. And it, it shares a lot of information with us that makes it useful for making recommendations. So let's talk about uh, regional meetings. So you know, you have trustee zones, and you've got uh, you know, the, uh, the high school attendance boundaries. And so we'll probably have a discussion about what's the most appropriate regional uh, meeting level is, but this is really so that there's an opportunity for the community at large to provide input because whatever the master plan solutions that are that we propose, the, 
the community needs to see their fingerprints on those designs uh, and priorities. So that engagement process is really key. So what does that look like? You know, the engagement process uh, ideally is a public gathering in person if we can manage it um, that has kind of a workshop format so everybody has a chance to be heard. Um, that idea that everyone has a chance to speak and engage with something and have their, their comments recorded and presented is really key. Um, we would ideally complement this with the digital process. So you guys uh, have used in the past like the thought exchange. So folks who have a hard time attending those person in-person meetings, they would have an outlet to at least be able to care, uh, communicate their, their, their thoughts and comments. And then followed up by that would be some online sessions. The online sessions we really imagine is a response to the final master plan. And so I kind of hinted at what that final master plan looks like. And the, uh, the great thing about master plans today is we can put them all online. So uh, in the, the goal of transparency, uh, being completely transparent about everything that you're proposing, uh, the best way to get community buy-in and support is to be fully transparent and to show all of the, uh, the master plan content. And so uh, the master plan that we're going to produce for you will have its own website. And it's fully transparent by communicating. You can see here the, the profile, the vision, um, the process that we're going through. So we'll be recording photographs of who attended, what was stated, you know, documenting the whole process. And then there would be uh, the actual master plans and then a summary of information. I've included a couple QR codes, and I wouldn't encourage you to necessarily peruse those, uh, those websites now, but as you're curious to see what does this look like, um, I've got two QR codes. One is uh, for the, the main master plan for another district that we recently did with Alvor, which is up in Riverside. And then the second one is a specific school that show, starts to show how that breakdown works. <coughs> this is kind of a, a screen capture of one of those pages. And what's really fun about this is, let's say we have a series of improvements that we've identified. And when it comes to priority, I don't want to be the one who does that. That needs to be something that you and your community decides. And so what this does is it provides line item lists for all the proposed improvements. And you can actually highlight several of those. And it starts with some basic ideas. And it'll tell you the cost. Let's say you want to do three of them. And it'll tell you the final cost associated with each of those line items. So you can start to revise your priorities about what you want to do on each campus, and it'll provide you the information in which to make a decision. That's really helpful for uh, defining cost and uh, figuring out what your improvement plans will look like. And then lastly, um, in the interests of uh, you know, transparency and prioritization, um, one of the things that we build into the website is demographic data which most boards find to be you know, really helpful. You guys have had a lot of conversation about the maps, about where people um, uh, are performing with their early childhood literacy. Um, this is similar information that will be helpful for you in deciding uh, which campuses to prioritize because it has uh, you know, demographic information such as uh, language, race, and other socio socioeconomic data that you can use for decision making. Um, when you pair this with the educational goals, and the facility conditions, it's a lot of really useful data for you guys to figure out what you'd like to do. And then lastly, I'll say is, you know, we expect to include you guys with regular updates in the process. Um, we don't operate behind closed doors. So as we are, you know, moving through the process, you can expect regular updates. And I, I know Ara will um, schedule those with you guys and get those on the agenda as we go. So. Would you mind going back to the page you did on the time? Oh, yeah. Sorry. So um, we wanted to touch on the timeframes of where we're at. So we're currently in task one for research and delivery. Um, task two is that facility condition assessment. It's going to take us about two months to do that. Um, and then probably the first task that we'll take on is meeting with the educational team, with, which is task three. And those are the educational specs. So we hope to have that uh, happen in the next month or so. And then the two months following that would be the facility conditions assessment. And our hope is that we could get to task four, which is the community outreach, just before uh, school, the school year ends, before summer. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to make it through all of those, those meetings before we hit summer, just because you know, you've got a lot of campuses. 
Um, but you can expect that we would be able to bookend summer with the community outreach in the front and the end. And then our hope would be that we would wrap things up by end of the, uh, the calendar year. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there any questions? I know it's a lot of information, but. Do you have a question from before? Because that means I did my job well. No questions. <laughs> I, I had just one question. You had mentioned the thought exchange, and I was wondering if there's any other digital engagement tools that you've used that may have you like found successful or any other ideas? Yeah, so the websites are really helpful for specific information. The thought exchange um, is really uh, refined for identifying um, like goals. So when we synthesize information, and I'll, I'll get a little bit academic, and I apologize. So we've got goals, facts, needs, and the, those are the three critical things that we need to produce solutions. Um, and usually the one that people are most interested in are goals and needs. And thought exchange actually does both of those things very, very well. Um, so depending on how we frame the question, the thought exchange uh, is typically the, the tool of choice that most school districts use. Um, we do have online surveys if we want to get um, at facts, but typically the, the facts are coming from our site analysis and meetings with um, the principals and the site users. Um, so the visioning is really what people get excited about, and thought exchange is really effective for that. But yeah, thought exchange surveys, and we can also provide some recommendations on some other tools, but that'll come through Ara and her team uh, as to what they would recommend. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm very excited about this. You should be. It's a really fun process. It's yeah. really great. Thank you very yeah. much. That's all? I think so. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited to get started on that. Um, our legislative and state budget update. Trustee Bartow. Thank you. Um, I was fortunate enough to be up with CSBA for their legislative committee meeting on February 17th. Uh, we discussed bills that CSBA staff recommended supporting or opposing. Um, our discussions were limited to bills that had been submitted prior to the due date of February 17th. As many, uh, many of you may know, that was the deadline for all bills to be submitted. So uh, CSBA said that that morning, they saw something like a thousand bills come in after 7 a.m. Um, we didn't discuss those. We discussed the ones that were submitted prior. Um, we had some really robust discussions. Uh, There's several delegates there. Um, ultimately, we accepted staff's recommendations on three bills. Um, AB 483 was proposed with a position of support on co consent. And uh, AB 483 is a bill that CSBA co-sponsored. Um, I'll read a little bit more about each of the text of the bills and what they are in a minute. Um, AB 19 was also voted on as a support as well after discussion. So um, AB 87 is a special education 504 plans. Um, the current law requires local education agencies to identify, locate, and assess individuals with exceptional needs and to provide those pupils with a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment with special education and related services as reflected in an individualized education program, so an IEP. Uh, current law authorizes the parent, guardian, or local education agency of those pupils to audio record the proceedings of individual education program team meetings. Uh, this bill would extend the authorization of audio recordings of individualized education program team meetings by a parent, guardian, or local educational agency to team meetings for pupils with an adopted plan pursuant to Section 504 of the Federal Rehabilitation Act of 1973. So uh, previously it was IEPs, now it would extend that to 504s as well. Um, AB 483, which is a bill that CSB co-sponsored, would allow the local education agency to provide a Medi-Cal billing option. Um, as many of our staff knows, that can be um, quite uh, detrimental to offering services because it is a, a large financial burden. Um, so current law establishes the administrative claiming process under which the State Department of Healthcare Services is authorized to contract with local governmental agencies and local education consortia for the purpose of obtaining federal matching funds to assist with the performance of administrative activities relating to the Medi-Cal program that are provided by a local government agency 
or LEA. Uh, current law requires the department to engage in specified activities related to the LEA Medi-Cal billing option, including amending the Medicaid state plan to ensure that schools are reimbursed for all eligible services, consulting with specified entities and formulating state plan amendments, examining methodologies for increasing school participation in the LEA Medi-Cal billing option, and conducting an audit of Medi-Cal billing option claim consistent with prescribed requirements. This bill would require the department to revise the state plan to establish a revised audit process for uh, Medi-Cal billing option claims submitted for dates of service on or after January 1st, 2025, pursuant to specified requirements and limitations. The bill would require the department to report the relevant policy committees and post on its internet website any changes made to the plan pursuant to the requirements to revise the state plan. The bill would require the department to provide technical assistance to the LEA or to complete appeals by the LEA within 180 days if an audit requires a specified percentage of the LEA's total value of claims to be paid back. And the bill would prohibit an auditor from determining that an LEA is required to pay back reimbursement for certain claims except as specified. So um, a lot of support there for uh, school districts. And then finally, AB 19 is one that has kind of risen to the forefront lately, um, but that one is regarding the... Uh, Naloxone and Narcan at schools. Um, current law authorizes school districts, county offices of education, and charter schools to provide emergency naloxone hydrochloride or another opiate, opioid antagonist to school nurses or voluntary trained personnel and authorize those nurses and voluntary trained personnel to use naloxone hydrochloride or another opioid antagonist to provide emergency medical aid to persons suffering or reasonably believed to be suffering from an opioid overdose as provided. This bill would require each individual public school operated by a school district, county office of education, or charter school to maintain at least two doses of naloxone hydrochloride or another opioid antagonist for purposes of those authorizations. So at Newport Mesa, we're a little head ahead of that, which is wonderful, but it's great that statewide that that's um, being proposed. Um, additionally, I accompanied members of 4th District PTA to Sacramento Safari, where we were able to meet with state legislators to express PTA's talking points regarding additional funding for Calisters and PERS and pension relief. Um, as you may know, this represents one of our district's largest budget line items and liabilities. Uh, we met with Senator Janet Nguyen, Senator Sharon Quirk Silva, Assemblywoman Diane Dixon, and State Superintendent of Schools Tony Thurmond, among others. Um, they bills we discussed were AB 19, AB 659, and e-bike safety legislation. Uh, everyone I've talked to, um, both CSBA and at PTA, uh, was very supportive of AB 19, so that's a bill that I think we have, uh, has reasonably good support to go through. Um, a little reminder, I thought it was really helpful at PTA how they went through how assembly bills go through all the different committees and are heard several times in the assembly before then going on to the Senate, going through those same committees and then eventually giving, uh, getting on the governor's desk to be signed into law. So I think uh, it's really helpful for our PTA advocates in particular. Uh, it was really wonderful to see some parents. Uh, it was a really wonderful group of moms and a few dads who were there and understood the process on how to advocate for um, bills that they really cared about. Um, anyways, after the meetings I had, uh, scheduled meetings and presentations, I had the opportunity to speak to Assemblywoman Diane Dixon and Senator Janet Nguyen regarding AB 659. Um, as you guys know, our board has received many emails from constituents regarding this bill, which would require the AP HPV vaccine as a condition for school enrollment for eighth graders statewide in both public and private schools. Um, I was able to express our constituents' opposition for the many reasons they have stated, and in addition, remind them that this would express a burden and barrier to entry for many um, families and students um, who are attempting to complete junior high and high school. Um, let's see. Uh, at both the CSBA meeting and Sacramento Safari, we heard information regarding the California state budget and concerns that available funds may be overstated by as much as $30 billion. Uh, the Legislative Affairs Office discussed some of the programs that could be cut to offset the deficit, such as the Extended Learning Opportunities um, Program and state preschool programs, but we'll see how the governor decides to handle this, this deficit. That remains to be seen. Uh, finally, another bill that's on my radar is uh, AB 1078, Instructional Materials, Removing Instructional Materials and Curriculum Diversity. Um, this is not one that we talked about on the 17th or at Sacramento Safari, but it does represent a bill that would affect all school boards and local control. Um, under the proposed legislation, uh, this is a quote that was added for the amendment, 
Commencing with the 2024-2025 school year, the governing board of a school district shall only remove books, publications, or papers from schools and school libraries with approval from the state board and in compliance with other procedures developed by the state board as described in section 33030.5. Um, for me, this is problematic because it affects our instructional materials and it impacts the district's ability to respond to these issues that occur in the classroom without the state oversight um, to do so. Um, if we had an instructional material, as you know, they're not always subject to that 30-day review period. If we had a material that uh, our district felt the need to remove, we would not be able to do so without first appealing to the State Board of Education. And I think that um, local school boards are elected by members of their community, and they should be able to govern and set policy in a way that's reflective of those communities. Uh, our schools are diverse, and we have diverse points of view, and we can hear them and discuss them. Um, but between community input and state standards, there are enough checks and balances to exist to provide a robust uh, curricular experience. School boards currently have the ability to choose and vet curriculum, and this law would remove that power in regards to instructional materials, which is especially problematic as instructional materials, like I said, are not always subject to the 30-day community review. So um, I, when I am again with CSBA, um, I'll be recommending personally, my personal um, recommendation would be to review 10, uh, AB 1078 and AB 659 um, as something that they may want to take a position on. But again, that will be something that the delegates and staff in the end determine. Did anyone have any questions? I feel like I gave a lot of information very quickly. Any questions? Did you want to add anything, Trustee Murphy, <laughs> to, to, that? to your legislative <laughs> uh, No, just that uh, we've been hearing that um, given that the tax filing deadline has been extended to October, um, it's going to take a long time for the governor and the legislature to make um, you know hard decisions on the budget. So there's still there's still hope. There's hope, but we might be negotiating into into end of summer, beginning of fall, so. Thank you. Okay, we will, thank you, Trustee Barto. Um, we will be moving to consent calendar. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, Pearson. Okay, moved by Trustee Crane, moved by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Wyken. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Okay. Next is um, item 22A approve elementary history, social studies, instructional materials for public display. Yes. Thank you, uh, President uh, Anderson. Again, I've asked Dr. Um, Lori Hernandez to come on up. She's been very busy. Uh, as you can tell, uh, Lori, uh, Dr. Hernandez has spent uh, the better part of the last year uh, in, a, in a teacher centered process, uh, really analyzing um, uh, 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 materials for history social studies to adopt for our K 5 classrooms. Um, and she's here to share that process before you this evening for discussion and action really is just um, uh, action item to approve that we put the, the recommended materials on display for public to review and comment. Thank you. Good, good evening again, uh, President Anderson, members of the board, Dr. Smith and staff and guests. Um, I'm going to provide some background to our recommendation for the board to approve history, social science, instructional materials for public display. Currently in Newport Mesa, grades K through 5 are using a program that was adopted in 2006 prior to the new framework. These materials are now out of print, which is necessitating a new instructional materials adoption uh, prior to the next upcoming school year. Grades 6 and elementary adopted in 2019 along with grades 7 and 8. The committee in total had set 47 members involved across the whole process, which included 37 classroom teachers who piloted materials. All teachers who wanted to be part of the process were accepted, and we had representatives from every zone, every grade level, and from special education. There are four programs currently adopted by the state of California, and as a committee, we took time to dig into all four of those programs. Um, typically, in a pilot process, you end up actually piloting two. So we started with the program Impact from McGraw-Hill because that is the program used in sixth grade, so we investigated that one first. 
and engaged in a pilot. After piloting IMPACT, we analyzed and evaluated the other three state-adopted programs, and we decided to pilot studies weekly. We reached consensus just this February to move forward with a recommendation for adoption of studies weekly. So the public review proposed to the board tonight is an opportunity for the community to view the student materials and provide feedback to be considered when the Board of Education takes action on this item on April 18th. With each pilot, we went through the same process. Um, classroom teachers were trained and received materials. They taught each program for six to eight weeks. And through each pilot, they were asked to complete lesson evaluations. So the areas evaluated were content alignment, inquiry, literacy skills, differentiation and access for all learners, assessment, and teacher resources. 155 lessons were evaluated over the course of both pilots. I'd like to now introduce uh, Ms. Brazem Lee, a third grade teacher from Lincoln. She was one of our pilot teachers and committee members, and she's gonna talk a little bit about the process of building consensus and share some of the highlights of Studies Weekly with you. Thank you. Um, I was happy to be part of this uh, pilot process um, and to bring a new history social science curriculum to Newport Mesa, as in my time here, I have pretty much taught the last one that Lori was, was mentioning. Um, as part of this committee, we previewed materials, we experienced them as teachers, the teacher side of it. We also observed our student um, interactions and experiences with the materials. Um, on January 30th and February 13th at our meetings, we reached consensus on Studies Weekly. During those meetings, we had collaborative discussions both with grade levels and as a whole group. Um, and we um, were very satisfied that Studies Weekly is the right decision for us to move forward with for um, our TK to five students. The Studies Weekly program is a user-friendly, consumable format. That is one of our pluses that we loved about it. I brought some samples here today. Um, each lesson or week um, is one single newspaper, um, which some of the pluses to that are students are able to write on it, take notes. Um, they're also able to then after that lesson, take it home and share it with their families. Um, there's also digital versions and online format. Um, online, there is also, um, let's see, let me go right ahead. <laughs> online, there is also PDFs of the student and teacher materials. There is additional photos, videos, resources. Uh, there are, um, there is, con oh, we also have continuous support from Studies Weekly during the process, and Dr. Hernandez was saying even post-process. Um, they have been very responsive to our needs and our questions and are easy to communicate with. Um, one of the great parts about the online part, the online platform that I appreciate is you can eliminate all lessons except the one you're working on. So when the students are accessing it online, they only see that one, which is especially good for even my third graders and younger um, to see only, you can even access only, you can even select only the article if you only want them to read a couple articles that day. Um, it is also easily accessible from ClassLink, which is very helpful. The print and online resources match. When I teach in my classroom, I love to have the newspaper out um, and then also have the online version up on my screen so that they can follow along um, and see the pictures in a bigger format um, and we can follow along both while teaching. Another positive that we loved is this online reader. So right at each article level, there is an audio version reading that for the students. I've used this whole class, but also great for independent um, work as well. Another positive we really loved was the amount and accessibility of assessments. There is article level assessments. So you read one article and they ask questions. The questions include inference, um, prior knowledge, past lessons are brought up again in future articles that they are connecting back to. There's also weekly assessments for the whole, the whole um, newspaper or the whole week lesson. And then there are unit assessments as well, which are fully um, editable and accessible online and in a print version. 
All right, so as I mentioned, um, tonight we are asking the board to approve the public display. Um, if approved, information about how to access materials will be posted on the Newport Mesa website by the end of day tomorrow, along with a link to submit comments about Studies Weekly, and then those comments would be brought to the board before the April board meeting. And as I mentioned, um, you know, when we after we return in April, if this program is adopted, our committee would then reconvene to plan for implementation and teacher professional development, collaborating with other districts using the program, um, and we would begin using materials in the upcoming fall. So at this time, uh, Mr. Drake and I are happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, Trustee Murphy. Um, yeah, that all looks really great. We were, uh, Trustee Pearson and I were trying to remember, we don't normally have a textbook in K through five th for history, right? In there are programs that come with a textbook. The current adoption we have is a consumable format, just like mm -hmm. studies. We yeah, have. I was going to yeah. say, I don't remember there yeah. being a book. Okay. Exactly. Teachers are familiar with yeah. this format. It's a similar and format. Similar. Okay. And then my other question would be, if there was one thing that you didn't like about um, studies, studies, would, we studies we weekly, weekly. If, if there was one thing that you didn't like, what would that if conceivably there was be? one thing, um, Ms. Brazenly, do you want to talk about that? Just a thought that I think came up a lot that kind of deterred us, but then we outweighed it, um, was actually these newspapers and how they come. And um, they come like one packet for each student, so like weeks one to 35. So there is some organization that needs to happen there. Um, our team has already talked about like ways that we can support teachers with that, because in our past, even though it was consumable, it was a book. So okay. it was like one book, it went in a student's desk. Um, there is advantage to this, and I really like it, but there is that piece of organization that um, we, we're on it. We're going to go with the plan. We'll be recruiting parent <laughs> volunteers to help us with that. One of the things that we talk about in the committee is that instructional materials are a tool, and no instructional materials are going to be perfect to meet everyone's needs. So we really weighed out the pros and cons, and anytime there's a con or the committee comes up with something that maybe we, we could see an improvement in that area, that's where we fill that gap with teacher training and with recommendations for our teachers. And we can also give feedback to the company, and they've been very responsive in developing new tools. The districts, neighboring districts like Irvine, um, Capo, Laguna Beach that are using this program have given input, and the company has actually made revisions based on that input. So they just rolled out a new online platform, and they're very friendly to input from districts. And so we do like that aspect of the program. Um, and so that's 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 why we chose it to move forward with. Great, thank you. Trustee Barto. Thank you very much. I signed up for a trial, so I went through all of the lessons. Um, I was up really late. Um, but I, I think overall that I was pleased with um, how a lot of the information the other portrayed more fairly than maybe other um, curriculum things that I've seen. Um, one little concern, and I think that this will kind of come out in the wash with parents. Some of the way, I think that the um, PDFs themselves were wonderful and the teacher's books were wonderful. Some of the ways that the voca vocabulary was handled maybe is a unit that we won't include because um, in a few sections they had things like uh, a first name as a vocabulary word, but it was lowercase. So I think maybe there's some quality issues there and nothing's perfect. So I'd rather have the information portrayed fairly and maybe we can opt out of that section. But um, overall, I think a, a lot of the information was uh, well portrayed. Thank you. So, Trustee Crane. Yeah, and in the interest of the, of the public, this is included. There's no fiscal impact. This is included in our adoption of the textbook itself, like the hand. The yeah, material. so, so the. Yeah, we have, you know, we're currently purchasing every year our history social right. science consumable. So, so it would be the same format. Right. It's, I mean, there's different ways. If we purchased hard copy textbooks, we would be paying a lot more up front, and those textbooks would last. If we do consumable, you spread it out. So, but it's the same, yeah, mm -hmm. as far as fiscal impact. Any other questions? Can we have a motion? I motion. Second. Moved by Trustee Murphy, seconded by Trustee Crane. Roll call vote. Student board member Ethan Krauss? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Weigand? Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. 
Um, next is item 22B, adopt resolution number 200323, recognizing February 2023 as Career Technical Education Month. Um, Dr. Torres, and then would Brian like to come up to do his comment? How would you like to do that? Oh, okay. How do you come up first? first. Please. Yes. <laughs> Uh, President Anderson, um, Superintendent Smith, trustees, um, executive cabinet. Um, obviously, I support this, um, being the superintendent of Coastline ROP. But I, you know, I just wanted to make a, a, a few points about um, ROP and CT and our relationship. First of all, it's good tonight um, to hear from TJ and the early learning folks that career technical education is really important. It's nice to hear that in pre-K they're talking about things like dentistry and engineering and construction. Um, and it's nice to also hear from from TJ that there is a real a growing realization um, across Newport Mesa and you know more broadly. <clears throat> in fact, there was an article in Harvard Business Review about this, that technical education and those um, types of skills are becoming more and more um, relevant, needed um, in our jobs. Um, it's been a little bit more than a year um, since I joined as superintendent, and I would like to thank everyone um, from, uh, from the board to Superintendent um, Smith to the CTE staff to your side administrators for your partnership. And um, I would like to, to thank you tonight for recognizing the work that we do together um, at for Coastline ROP and Newport Mesa Unified to make a difference in the lives of, of all of our students. Um, for us, more broadly, for CTE Month, we actually were using it as, as a um, marketing and awareness vehicle of the work that ROP does and the, and the importance of CTE. Um, and, and we did everything from social media to, um, in fact, inviting Senator Min, who had to postpone his visit, but taking Senator Dave Min, um, the California State Senator, to Estancia High School last week. And, and thanks to Trustees Bartow and Murphy from jo for joining me and Senator Min and uh, Costa Mesa City Councilman Lauren Gameros um, for, for, you know, going to view all of those classes. Um, I also um, would like to add, for those of you who really are, uh, who are not aware of it, we actually are doing something really unique in Newport Mesa this year with Careers with Children Internship. Um, the students in that program are actually doing their internships at Newport Mesa pre-K and TK sites, which is really unique for us and really a great program and, and kind of, um, you know, a double benefit for, mm -hmm. for something like that. Um, one of the things we also did this last month is we had students in your classes create videos about what they love about those classes. Um, I really believe that the student voice is really important in, in conveying the importance of, of, of CTE. Um, and then, um, you know, lastly, um, for, for us, um, one of our big focuses in CTE is, is expanding our virtual class offerings because we know it's really important for students to be able to, to take these types of courses, especially after Bell, given the sliding um, start date. Um, and um, the issues around transportation, you know, for a lot of students getting to and, point, uh, to and from point A and point B. And so, you know, we have medical innovation, research, entrepreneurship. We, um, we expanded cyber forward. We expanded uh, artificial intelligence. And we have a lot of other areas to come. And so thank you very much for your support and for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Dozer. And um, in front of you this evening, um, item B, you have the resolution uh, to acknowledge um, February as Career and Technical Education Month. And uh, lots of great words spoken tonight about our CTE per, uh, program and partnership and the importance of work-based learning. It continues to be one of our passion projects and investments that we're making in helping um, our students attain the opportunities to uh, gain employment immediately um, after they graduate from us or get that experience to continue on with their education. So that's what you have in front of you tonight. Thank you very much. Anyone have any comments? Okay, do I have a motion? I make a motion. I second. Okay. Moved by Trustee Bartow, seconded by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote. Student board member Ethan Krause? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wagen? Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Yes. Next is 22C, accept financial audit reports for the 2021-22 year. Mr. Trader. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Shiloh Garosby. She is a partner with your audit firm, Ide Bailey. 
And I say your audit firm because uh, she reports directly to you. She does not report to staff. And we um, partner with them. Uh, it's an important relationship and we see them as a key to helping us be compliant and uh, continuously improve. So with that, uh, Shiloh. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'll just take a few minutes of your time to go over the results for June 30, 2020 audit. And then, of course, if there's any specific questions, I'm happy to um, respond to those as well. So our audit, what are we here for? We're here to provide you with what we call reasonable assurance, not absolute, but reasonable assurance that the financial statements that were presented for you as of June 30 are materially stated based on our audit. So the highest level of assurance in an audit that we can provide you is what we refer to as an unmodified opinion. That would be a clean report, and that is what you have in your audit package tonight is an unmodified opinion. So that means that based on our audit, we do believe your financial statements to be materially stated. In addition to your report on the financial statements themselves, we provide you a report on the internal controls over financial reporting, and that report is required as well by our government's auditing standards. So that's not an opinion on, on your internal controls, rather our, our requirements are if internal control deficiencies come to our attention that rise to the level of what we would call significant deficiencies or material weaknesses, we would be required to report those to you. So that report, we're happy to say no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in the internal control structure over financial reporting. So that's a clean report on your internal controls over financial reporting. The next report is your federal program audit. So again, we are mandated to complete an audit and are under uniform guidance for federal programs. Um, just because it's been such a hot topic, a lot of money coming through school districts related to COVID and, and a lot of one-time money. So you know those ESSER and GEAR programs that you're all so familiar with, we're part of that audit. And this year, I just think that's important to mention. Many people ask about that. And then as well as the special education, which is a large program for the district. So that was also subject to audit. So that um, audit, we have an unmodified opinion for your programs. No material weaknesses in internal control. We did have one reporting finding related to your ESSER gear programs, specifically related to just timing of when we're reporting expenditures. The nice thing about that, um, well, I mean, we don't like findings, but the, the piece of that that really makes it um, somewhat of a non-issue, while we have to report the reporting non-compliance, it is one of those things that doesn't have any fiscal impact, and it is one of those um, uh, findings where the district is able to just basically true it up in the next quarter because they are doing regular reporting. So it just corrects itself, uh, and so it's already a non-issue is really what I wanted to point out. And then last but not least, state programs. We are required to test a significant number of state programs. So this year, the, we had over 30 programs that were probably part of the state compliance audit. And with that, uh, we did have some areas where we had some, what we call qualifications, but really more just uh, findings that came about in some of the areas of the audit. Uh, they are all listed in the audit report. I know everybody got their reports in advance. So I'm hoping that everybody had a chance to review those specifically. Uh, most of them were pretty minor issues, um, none that have any significant financial impact to the district, but I'm happy to address any specific questions on any of the um, uh, findings or any other pages of the report. I'll pause and allow you that opportunity now. Trustee Barto. Yes, uh, regarding the management controls, and then there were a few immaterial um, amounts. Do you have any recommendations for those on um, things that we can do? So are you talking about the item, like more of the ASB related at the back of the report or any particular? Yes. yes. Um, okay. Well, you know, that's a tough one. We always say, and, and I hate to say we have, you know, somewhat of ongoing issues there just because the nature of those um, activities and the nature of generally turnover in those. I think the district does a pretty good job with district oversight. I think ongoing training is always important in monitoring where you have turnover in those positions to make sure those folks are are getting up to speed. I mean, it's a fast paced environment with those programs and it's really hard, I think, when you do have people moving about to make sure that we're just staying up to speed. But just that ongoing training is really the biggest piece of it. Thank you. You're welcome. Trustee Crane. Yes, hi. For the um, Measure F perform performance audit, um, you, mentioned, you mentioned a significant risk identified uh, under management override of controls. Can you define management? Would that be a superintendent, a director, an assistant superintendent? And 
Yes. So example. you're actually touching on a point that I hadn't mentioned yet, but you know what? We'll just or jump right to it since you have brought it up. But as part of the communication letter that we also provide you with your audit, there are a lot of um, communications we bring to you. Did we have disagreements with management? Did we have issues in conducting the audit? And the new item this year is, is Ms. Crane, is what you're, you're referencing. So we're talking about a couple of items that, and this is actually in your letter in both reports, because you do have the Measure F um, report as well. So it's in your financial audit for the district, as well as that letter for, for Measure F. But um, essentially, one of the new requirements for communication is what you're referring to. So what we're doing is in an audit, and this is happening in all audits, so it's not um, necessarily a specific um, uh, component to you, but auditors are required to evaluate where risk in an audit is, 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 where it exists, and a design our audit procedures to address those risks. So two of the main risks we always talk about are management's ability to override control structures, and then our rec revenue recognition is the other one. So that's what the communication points are. Just because we're identifying those risks I just want to make sure I'm clear because this has come up a lot in presentations this year. We are not suggesting that those risks resulted in issues for your district. They're just things we've addressed in our audit procedures to make sure you don't have findings in those areas. If you had findings in those areas, you'd have findings that you know you were reading. But to answer your question, who is management? Management really is anybody at that level and really probably more tailored to on the business side of things. So I'm sorry, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff would be one that we would probably be saying, hey, does Jeff have the ability to influence the financial statements through his uh, management position? And we do, um, we perform audit procedures. So he might have influence that there's, he's not doing anything to um to, to use that influence to influence the financial statements. And so one of the things we we do, we use data analytics to do analysis of things like journal entries in your financial statements to make sure journal entries are appropriate and that people who are supposed to be involved in journal entries are the actual people involved in journal entries and, and things like that. So that's some of the ways that we address that risk, but it would focus a bit more in the business side, people who can influence the financial statements. Thank you. You're welcome. That was probably a long-winded answer for that question, but that's helpful. Does anyone <laughs> have any other questions? Okay, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. I second. Moved by Trustee Barto, seconded by Trustee Murphy. Student Board Member Ethan Cross? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Very much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Okay, item 22D, approve the 2022-23 second, second period interim report of district financial status. Mr. Secretary. Uh, I can't uh, I can't overstate how important this uh, time is to be with you to um, account for our progress since first interim. Uh, you know, <clears throat> as Dr. Smith hold, holds us accountable to uh, move us forward on your priorities. Um, we we may think that what we're talking about tonight is galaxies away from them. But I dare say that if our financial house isn't in order, that we wouldn't be making the progress that we are on those priorities. And so I really, really appreciate your time tonight. It's really, really important that we um, account for what we're doing on the financial side of the house. So it, you hear all these, I, I sit here and on all these presentations on and all the great stuff happening with students and kind of feel like, oh, we talked to you about money, but it's, uh, it's important. So uh, anyways, um, so first of all, second interim, it's, uh, it's required by law, and we, uh, it's marking time from uh, November to January 31st, and includes multi-forecast, multi-year forecast, and insert a concern. In other words, be a going concern. In other words, uh, two years on out, we're saying, hey, we've got no problem. We're good fin from a financial perspective. And here we are in the financial reporting cycle, um, in January, the, the uh, governor came with his budget, and you've heard this, and, and it's a favorable budget. 
he's going to fund everything that he that uh, the state is committed to, uh, full funding, and that's great news for us. It's going to help us with uh, ELOP and universal meals. Super helpful. Um, he he does have a twenty two and a half billion dollar deficit, so there is going to there's going to be some. Um, some issues he's going to have to deal with, but it's it's a favorable budget for us. We're we're really pleased with that. So here we are at second interim here in March, and so let's uh, let's talk about let's uh, buckle up and get into the galaxy of numbers. Really fun. Um, so here we are at uh, revenue increased. You can see where we are at June adoption and first interim, and then the the far on the far right second interim, and we increased about six hundred thousand dollars in federal revenue and uh, about 2.9 million in other local revenue. And most of that being uh, interest and um, uh, local support, donations, those kinds of things. And that's a normal kind of thing. We see that at this time of year, very normal for us to experience this. Uh, and then let's take a look um, here at uh, our general fund expense. And you know, it's a matched. So we have about three and a half million more in revenue and three and a half million more in Expenditures, surprise, surprise, right? That's a that's a good thing. It's a good mark to be able to always have those things aligned. And so again, staffing up by six hundred thousand dollars, non-staffing up by two point nine million. Most of that in uh, services, and we had a large adjustment for utilities uh, this time. We're finding utilities are are getting uh, a little pricier. So, with that, then we made a correction. So, uh, and then other financing uses, this is basically transfers out. Transfers out remained unchanged from the first interim. And then ending fund balance slightly increased um, by about $26,000. So very uh, stable there. And so when we look at the multi-year outlook, um, you know, it was interesting. I believe it was Trustee Crane who called, uh, asked a question last time about um, uh, pension rates. And how the market kind of tanked, and and I said, oh no, they, you know, there's no, uh, they're they're moving right along. We're we're not expecting any dramatic change. Well, I, I'm I'm I stand corrected because they corrected themselves, and and uh, it looks like uh, pension rates are going to go up another five percent over the next few years. That's fairly significant um, when you think about it. In 2013-14, pensions accounted for five percent of our budget. By the time we get to 24, 25, um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, by the time we get to 24, 25, you're going to look at pensions being 12% of our budget. It's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's amazing um, what, what's happened there. And, and we're, we're taking care of it. But I just want to let you know that that's, a, that's an issue that we're dealing with and, and sharpening our pencil on. And then uh, let's take a look at our pro uh, our overall performance. If you look at the top blue line there, that's total revenues. Um, and then the, the orange line, the next lowest line, that's our basically our property taxes. So you see we're leading with property taxes. Property taxes are are robust. They're they're it's a it's a good story. Um, so it's really uh, helping us through this. And then of course the the other line, the yellow line. Uh, uh, state and federal. You can see there the bump there that begins in 2021. And now those are, you can see there the drop off begins in, uh, you know, 23, 24, and will continue to drop off. So we'll uh, be sharpening our pencil out in those years. Um, revenue expense, a good story, revenue expense are aligned. And uh, we have a responsible ending fund balance. You can see there the ending fund balance is is, has been increasing, and, and that's a result of having a lot of one-time money uh, come to us over a period of time, and it will leave us over a period of time. And so you'll see uh, that we have an uh, ending fund balance that is um, going to stabilize and is going to come down, and we expect that to, to happen. That red line there, that is actually our, our what do you call it, our low cash point. We, we track cash because cash is really, really important to us. As a community-funded district, we don't get like monthly installments from the state. It's a little bit of different payment period. And so we have a cash dry period between July and December. And so we watch that really, really carefully. And as you can see there, in, you know, we normally have about a, 
uh, a $20 million deficit uh, for a low cash point. Um, because we had all this one-time money, we've had a higher cash low point, but that's gonna go down later on in the future. Overall, it's a great story. We um, recommend a positive certification for second interim. Thank you for your time tonight. <coughs> Thank you, Trustee Murphy. Um, yes, thanks, Jeff. One question on slide 11. You said pension costs are crowding out alternatives. What did you mean by alternatives? So when, when we take, when you think about this, when, when <laughs> pensions are 5% of your budget in 2014, and then they go to 12% of your budget, there's 7%. Where does that 7% go, right? That 7% is, is in alternatives that we could have done, but we aren't because uh, we have this higher pension cost. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to say that. <laughs> You know, it's hard to say, but that's really uh, candidly the truth about it uh, uh, with that. So, I mean, we're doing the best that we can with that. Trustee Barto. Um, with the uncertainty coming from the governor's budget, even though it looks like we got a little break for a little bit longer, um, what kinds of plans do we have to weather that? You know, some of our priorities are... Um, based on one-time funds, what, what are we looking at for the future? So yes, we're looking at ESSER funds going away, gear funds, um, all of that going away. And, and we, are, uh, we have a great plan for that. Um, <clears throat> we're being really thoughtful about whatever we give up, we're going to give up for something that is unquestionably better. And and, and you'll see there, you know, we, we have done some extraordinary things um, for COVID to mitigate those impacts. And those things, we're, we're going to get better. Our students are, are uh, I, I may need some help from Ed Services, but our students are going to, they're going to get better. They're going to get over COVID. They're not going to need certain things that we're providing currently at this time. And so we will adjust, you know, to, to meet their needs where they're at. And their needs will change. Did I get that right? Or yeah. do you, you yeah. want to That was excellent. Okay. Yeah. That was excellent. That was Mr. Beautiful. Trader. Yes, we're assessing all, this, all the student <laughs> needs to make sure that we're making the right ones. <laughs> yeah. Go, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment on um, the SIRS and PERS obligation, and I'm, I'm happy to see that groups, uh, as Trustee Bartow mentioned, are advocating that the state pay down that SIRS and PERS obligation for districts. So if they pay down the obligation, that helps us in perpetuity. Um, and it's unfortunate that they're trying to make up for bad investments years ago on the backs of employees and students uh, at the district level. It's also a bit of a shame that with this arts and block grant that I mentioned earlier, again, gratitude to folks like capital advisors and others that fight for us in those conversations. Um, but, but as we look at those opportunities, the governor said, well, I'll give you flexibility with that art and block grant. You don't have to spend on art or music or any of that. You can spend it on the PERS and STIRS obligation. So on the one hand, he takes credit for giving us this art and music block grant, and also takes credit for helping us with the stirs and purse obligation, and then proposes deficiting that same block. It's head scratching. Um, so I just wanted to say that, that this is significant, I think, to Trustee Murphy's point. Um, what does it come uh, to? It comes at the expense of many other things we could do for our students, for our facilities, and for our employees, for heaven's sakes. Um, so I'm glad that there are groups out there fighting for this, and we're going to ask our folks in Sacramento to keep fighting for that as well. Any other questions or comments? Trustee Crane? Yes, we, we have a legislative week coming up for CSBA, so this is a good time to voice our opinions on that again and again, because I know we did it last year with our legislators. We'll do it again. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved. 
by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Ursula. Roll call vote. Student Board Member Ethan Kress? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Okay. And next we have 22E, approved CSBA Delegate Assembly Election for 2023. And I have some suggestions. Um, I suggest that we um, vote for our very own Trustee Barto, um, for Trustee Bonnie Castry, um, Jackie Philbeck, Carrie Flanders, Lauren Klatzner, um, Kelly Osborne, Rodia Sheed, and Susie Schwartz. Do I have a motion? I move to accept your, your slate. Second. Moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Murphy. Roll call vote. Student Board Member Ethan Krauss? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigand? Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursulu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Okay. Item 22F, mm. adopt um, 2023 Board Governance Protocols. Yeah, one of the uh, best practices uh, prescribed all around the country for school boards is to meet in the study session workshop type environment and to talk about their, their ways of working together. Uh, relationships don't get better because we ignore them. They get, they get better because we're intentional about becoming better. And those agreements are a big part of it. Um, so we've gone through the process of study. Uh, work study, study shop, workshop on this. Um, a great meeting we have before you today are those recommended edits. And tonight we would um, like for the board to consider final edits and potential adoption if there's unanimous support moving forward. And I had um, one comment on here from um, Trustee um, Wigand who is not able to be here tonight. Um, she had a comment on um, the section under governance, relationships, and productivity, onboarding, ongoing and onboarding. Um, to add to number three, uh, if concerns persist, the board president or designee will meet with the trustees one-on-one. -on -one. Questions, comments, any additions? Uh, I just wanted yeah. to comment on the process I thought it was I thought it was a very um, open honest raw process that needed to be you know done as far as a team and I just wanted to um, congratulate all of the trustees for you know being um, introspective and and um, have great discussions so I'm really happy about the result thank you anyone else I think that we are good to go on this for next year. I, I love the ability to go through it every year and talk through. I think it's really powerful. Things change. There were things with COVID last year <laughs> that we needed to update. Um, so I think that's a good practice. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, moved by Trustee Crane. Seconded by Trustee Murphy. Roll call vote. Student Board Member Ethan Krauss? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Trustee yes. Trustee Wigand? Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Barto? Yes. Okay, number 23, informational report, mm -hmm. superintendent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to once again highlight the great work we have with our communities, both communities in this regard, um, law enforcement. Uh, this week we met with the Costa Mesa Police Department to talk about software that would help in incident uh, management and how they could respond better, uh, more accurately and appropriately uh, in, in collaboration with this. Um, once again, as we study how to make our schools, buildings, 
uh, employees, students, save their entities. And further, we work with other entities. And so I just want to give a shout out to Costa Mesa PD. We have similar conversations in Newport Beach. Also, we're meeting this week with the Gang Intervention Coalition, um, not because we have a major problem, but because we want to avoid major problems. We want to be intentional with both communities and their resources so that we're staying on top of this for the safety of our students. Had a great opportunity to meet with Supervisor Foley. I want to thank her again for the investment into our arts and make sure that she's at the photo op when we get that piano, Tamara. Um, but also she, she had a real interest this conversation in literacy and supporting us. So I hope someone from her office was able to see that great presentation that we saw tonight because that data uh, is, is valid, it's reliable, and it's impressive. Um, and I know that Annette's going to do a great write-up on what we saw today and push that out to our communities and families, and I hope we share it with uh, Supervisor Foley as well to encourage her, and, and if there's something any of you can think of on the staff uh, with which she and her team or her office and resources can support, she said she's all in. Read Across America. Going through that has been awesome. I was able to go to Newport L and watch lifeguards in flip-flops read to students. And it was just, it was amazing. And the questions the kids asked, and they were dressed up like their heroes. And a couple of them were dressed up like uh, lifeguards. And a lot of them in the junior lifeguard outfit. They were just so proud of, of their lifeguards. I thought that was amazing. And once again, it's about literacy, about reading, and that everyone in our community reads. That's a strong message. And to that point, hopefully you got a chance to see that Read Across uh, America video that we put out. Our team does a lot of, of great videos. That one was just awesome. Our board president was one of the stars at the beginning. Uh, but the message at the end with that collage was just, it was touching. If you haven't seen it, check it out in English and in Spanish. Uh, and speaking of our team, I got to give a, a, a big shout out. I just said we do great videos at the ASPRA, Cal ASPRA. So that's for public relations in California. We got three more awards this year and we'll have the plaques to show it. So to the team, uh, well done with, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> They, they even do it with challenging content. They took Where is Wes to an award-winning program. Again, <laughs> very little content. They do a heck of a job. Just want to give them a shout out. That's great. Okay. Who would like to go first rather than picking a side? Um, many of the things that I've been up to the last two weeks we've already talked about. So um, I did really enjoy going uh, to Estancia uh, two times in the last uh, month and CTE programs, and I'm always impressed by the quality of all of their programs, the digital media arts, the uh, construction, the health uh, pathway, uh, all really robust, powerful programs and lots of um, – students who are really excited to be at school um, and be doing th pursuing things they love. And uh, a few students in the engineering pathway um, were really excited to show us at Estancia the Haas machine, which is uh, metal, basically. It's, it's sort of like 3D printing for metal, and then it grinds it down. Um, it was donated. It's a, you know, half a million dollar uh, machine and it uh, to watch the things that they created and the pride um, and the students uh, advocacy they they spoke with when Senator Min was there one of them said you know can I get a congressional letter of recommendation and it was it was really cool to watch these students who had found a path they liked but were the different directions that they were going to translate that in their lives college um, military service things like that that was amazing um, and then the only other thing I won't be able to make it but tomorrow is the Newport Harbor High School spring concert so if you um, are able to attend highly recommend it's always a really wonderful program Trustee Payne speaking of read across America we are looking forward to the battle of the books uh, <laughs> that made it come back this is the second year after after COVID um, the event is on March 23rd, I believe, at Oasis Senior Center, and it's going to involve five of our five of the six schools are um, from Newport Mesa. We have um, Anderson, Newport Coast, Newport L, Sonora, East Bluff, and then OL, OLQA, which is Our Lady Queen of Angels. So we're looking forward to to that coming up. Um, the Newport Mesa Schools Foundation uh, they received 124 grants this year which is amazing. 
and uh, it was an increase of 34 grants from last year, and they intend to spend about $100,000 uh, towards that. And uh, they, of course, are looking forward to the, the, the um, event that they sponsor, the Teacher Grant Award Banquet on May 10th, and then that will also be held at the Oasis, Oasis Senior Center. And we attended all types of events, including an amazing performance by Orcasis, the dance uh, uh, group out of CDM. It was absolutely amazing. Um, I'm just constantly amazed at our kids' talents. Uh, whatever passion they choose, they just excel at, and that's basically what is the formula for success, is passion. And the CDM car show on March 27th, I do know that TJ it has been working really hard with, with that. You want to go and hang, have any kind of antique car, and you'd want to go and hang out in a parking lot, which is, I see that a lot across the coast. Um, please do come and, and participate. Um, let's see. The Parent Ed Series on Cyberbullying is on the 15th of this month at 6 p.m. Please go and click on the link in our website and join in. It is about how to raise digital citizens, responsible digital citizens. We have digital citizens. We just need them responsible. <laughs> and uh, lastly, we, we, well, a huge announcement to our CDM community is the fact that uh, graduation is returning to our home turf. I can't even stress how excited our community is, whether it's the students who are coming back and graduating on their, again, their, their home field, and the families and parents. So thank you to all who contributed to the effort, including Dr. Haley. And lastly, it was bittersweet um, approving the consent calendar because we, part of it was approving the retirement of our Candy Barella, who loyally sits in the back every, every board meeting and stays till the end. We're watching. <laughs> um, you will be missed. Yeah. That's sweet. Me to go. Um, I also had the privilege of touring Estancia and Costa Mesa High um, this month. And wow, um, so impressed with the kids, the teachers, the programs. Um, got to spend a lot of time in the CT classrooms. And wow, um, they were amazing. The kids were engaged, they were up, they were bandaging up um, fake injuries, they were. <laughs> Uh, building bridges. Um, they were working on technology that I thought was only at the college level. Um, in incredibly impressed with the program. Um, and as I go out and brag about it, I hear parents saying to me often now that my kid is coding now because of a class they took at Newport Harbor. My child is in digital, um, digital media because they took a class at CDM. And that is just so rewarding and so incredible. I'm incredibly um, proud of the district because of that. Um, was also able to attend um, a play at Lincoln Elementary um, and was able to spend the day today at the 49th CDM home tour, which talk about amazing was absolutely incredible. It's the only um, PTA fundraiser that they do at CDM and to Gina Jaha and her committee. Um, unbelievable. The, the, the details, um, every, the seven houses were amazing. They had a rock band the, from students at CDM playing at one of the houses. They had business owners, um, ice cream trucks outside the, the, the home. So after they toured the home, they can have a free ice cream. Um, the tour, the, the theme of the tour was endless possibilities, and that was their their take was everything is possible when we come together as a community. And today we definitely saw um, teachers, the parents, residents, and the small and business owners um, come together to really help um, CDM and make it a, really all the entire district, but CDM um, and make and help our children um, succeed. So. Thank you to everybody who was involved with that. Um, Harbor Views play is March 16th and 17th. I'm looking forward to that. Anderson has a big STEAM 
egg drop and steam it, which I have not been able to attend, but I will um, this year, March 22nd, and again, the CDM car show on March 26th. What? And what? And the new meeting three, sorry, 313.23. Would you like to go next? Oh, sure. Um, uh, same, Estancia, the tour of uh, the CTE and ROP tour was great. Um, the construction, the new construction program is fantastic. It was great to show uh, Councilman Guillermo's uh, what we could do and maybe look at expanding the program uh, into other schools. So that was fantastic. Obviously seeing the kids do way more than I ever did in high school was, you know, sort of eye opening. Either that or I'm just really old. And, um, and, uh, so thank you to everyone at Estancia and, uh, for Trustee Bardo for putting that together with the Senator. I think he was very impressed with our work. So that was great. Um, Costa Mesa United, I went to their Youth Sports Council meeting that was here. Um, it was a great group. Um, all of the teams were represented. They're very anxious to get going on their seasons, and the rain is not helping. Um, so, so there was a little bit of, of frustration there, but um, great team energy in terms of the communication that the district provides with the city and the team. So lots of thanks um, all around for that. And you can tell that everyone um, really tries to provide the best atmosphere that they can um, um, the best fields, the best playing um, places for the kids. So that was great. They were happy about um, our improvements to Costa Mesa, the team building and the stands. Um, Costa Mesa High School Foundation, we also provided funding for um, the soccer nets and bleachers by the softball field. So that was a big cheer all the way around. Um, also got a chance to attend Costa Mesa's Bravo Coast, uh, Spring Concert, their orchestra and jazz ensembles, and um, that was amazing. Um, it's kind of fun to sit there and not realize you're listening to a, a high school band, orchestra or band. It, they sound so professional, and um, it's so cute to see them all dressed up and, and ready to perform. So that was great. Our music teachers at Costa Mesa Middle School and High School are obviously fantastic, and so thank you to them and everything that they do for the kids and how much that how much support and energy they put into those performances and and making them shine the students shine so that was great um i'd also like to thank uh the team over at costa mesa middle school and high school dr kwong and dr depali um dr potness uh they have been working on some of the um some of the bullying issues and um and having some great assemblies um and great parent and student communication um, and really I think taking the issue um, head on in terms of of realizing that we need to make sure, not realizing, but in reinforcing um, the need for safety and safe spaces at all of our schools. And so I just want to thank them for all of their hard work on that. Um, and um, I know COVID is is hopefully Jeff. We get through it, and some of the some of these issues subside. So I'm right there with you, and, and hopefully we can spend some money on some other things. But it's nice to know that we're proactively addressing these issues now. So I think it's only going to be better for our students in the future. So thank you. And that's it. So I don't have much to report. I may be the only one up here that was not at Estancia this month. Sorry, <laughs> Principal Halton students. It seems like everybody's gone but me. Um, but their WASCA accreditation meeting is tomorrow night. So any parents that are interested, um, I believe the Zoom is at 7 o'clock tomorrow. Um, so please, um, parents, go and make it to that if you can to um, share your thoughts on Estancia and what they need. Um, I, this month did not go to the youth sports meeting either. I've literally been nowhere this month, um, because I was at my first five commission meeting where I'm a, a commissioner. So we got to review all of that EDI data and work to figure out ways that, um, the first five commission can continue to partner with school districts like ours. So that was really great, but it kept me away from the sports meeting, which was a bummer. Um, and I think that is about all I have done this month, except sell Girl Scout cookies. So <laughs> that is all I have to report. That's, 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 a, that's, a, part -time, that's a part time job in and of itself. 
Um, I was able to attend the Arts Co. A wonderful event at T-Winkle led by Tamra. We had um, a great group of people that were talking through challenges and getting to envision what they would want the arts to look like if they could do anything in Newport Mesa, which I always love those types of conversations. Um, and then also we have um, coming up on um, March 23rd, the future Trojan night. So um, for our sixth grade parents that are interested in attending um, T Winkle, that is a great opportunity to come and check it out and talk to the teachers. Um, and then I had a call from IKEA this week and they're looking forward to partnering again to appreciate our teachers in a variety of ways. Um, and so they're really excited and preparing now for that. Um, they. It was really wonderful last year, all the things that they had planned. Um, and then on May 27th, there will be a Estancia zone, but also Costa Mesa. Anyone in Costa Mesa can attend a bike radio to go over e-bike safety, get free um, bike helmets, and um, just kind of do some reminders for parents and for children about bike safety. And that's it. All right, and it is 8.44, and we will adjourn the meeting. Work today.